A very warm welcome to this fourth edition of the Forum of the Middle East Mediterranean Summer Summit here in Lugano. Benvenuti, bienvenue, ahla wa sahla, mi Lugano. We're very, very happy to present this year's edition, even though it's hybrid um, because of comprehensible reasons. So I would like to welcome the audience who's following us online. And of course, I'm thrilled to welcome the excellencies here in Lugano, live, and with distinguished guests as well. I'm particularly proud and happy that over 30 young changemakers from the MEM region made it to Lugano and have followed a very interesting seminar all week. This is the heart of the MEM Summer Summit uh, as well, to have this participation and culminating in the forum, having a dialogue with uh, world leaders. So very happy to welcome everybody and we hope to have a very interesting program today in Lugano. Without further ado, I would like to welcome and hand over the word to Boaz Erez, the rector of the Università della Svizzera Italiana. Benvenuto, welcome. It is a pleasure as rector of Università della Svizzera Italiana, USI, to welcome you to the fourth edition of the Middle East Mediterranean Summer Summit. This is our contribution as a small university, as a young university, to enhance, to make better the situation in the region, but also to improve the exchanges between Europe and the region. As Gilles Capel, who is the professor at the university, who helps us organize uh, this seminar, who is at the heart of the network of people who meet here in person says, well, the future of Europe is decided in the Middle East. This is, in a few words, an explanation of the importance this summit has for us and how we value our contribution. We believe that face-to-face -face encounters are very, very important. Of course, intercultural dialogue is fundamental too, but we believe that in-person physical meetings are inescapable. Of course, COVID last year has not made it possible for us to meet with the young change makers of the region, but this year we're very happy to have some 30 young and dynamic people involved in the civil society present here in Lugano, coming from all over the region, representing a variety of cultures, traditions, and countries. They're here with us today, and they are participating in the debates, in the panels that have been organized, and uh, in particular, well, we're very happy to have here in person Federal Council uh, Ignacio Cassis, who is the head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, who supports our initiative, who has brought with him and who will discuss uh, His Excellency the Foreign Minister of the Sultanate of Oman. And we are thrilled to hear what he will say. We are thrilled to hear what the various participants in the panels will bring to our attention. We are thrilled to see what the young change makers who will participate in all of these panels will bring as their contribution. Because we think that, of course, the youth who represent 80% of the population in the region, well, is actually the main actor in the changes to come. What is our method? Well, it's very simple. We try to build new narratives for the future. Of course, you can't live without conflict, but we do not emphasize conflicts. We emphasize, actually, what unites us. We believe that what unites us is much more important than what divides us. And it is under this slogan that we organize this Middle East Mediterranean Summer Summit. So I hope you will enjoy the, our program and that you will follow our activities, which, starting from last year, are not limited to these week in Lugano, but are exported through the network of young change makers we are forming well, throughout the year. In particular, we'll be present in December 
at the Expo Dubai, and we're participating in a number of initiatives um, where civil society plays an important role because we believe that, uh, again, face-to-face -face encounters, discussions, uh, knowing each other personally is what will be cementing a better future for everyone. Thanks for following us today. Thank you so much, uh, Rettore, for this meaningful and um, great introduction and welcoming word. We're very honored to have um, His Excellency uh, Cassis and His Excellency El Busedi for the keynote speeches. We have the pleasure and the honor to start with a real Ticinese, uh, His Excellency Ignacio Cassis, Vice President of the Federal Council and Head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland. Thank you so much. Prego, Consigliere Federale. Well, again, thank you uh, so much, uh, Signora Segantini, for this introduction, and uh, uh, thank you also for the uh, invitation. His Excellency, Minister Said Badr al Busaidi, dear friend, Egregio Rettore dell'Università della Svizzera Italiana, che ho perso di vista, caro Boas, um, care e cari partecipanti, eh, giovani presenti qui oggi, cher e cher participants, the participants, and to those who are following us on streaming. On behalf of uh, the Swiss Confederation, I welcome you to the fourth edition of the Middle East and Mediterranean Summer Summit. I am particularly happy to address uh, you again from the city of Lugano, the city where I was born and where I grew up. We have all been going through very special times. Personal contacts uh, have been reduced to a minimum. Exchanges were shifted uh, to the virtual space. Uh, and last year's uh, MEM Summer Summit was no different. And it was still a great success. Nevertheless, it feels good to reconnect and exchange in person. Exchange is uh, at the very heart of the MEM Summer Summit. This year, Again, over 100 young changemakers from the region of the Middle East and North Africa have been selected to participate in the summit, with around 30 of you here being here in Lugano today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Now more than ever, such platforms are essential. The MENA region is changing fast, and the COVID-19 pandemic has brought further challenges. We have seen some positive signs uh, of cooperation and empathy among actors in the region, while tensions within and between countries still remain. The MENA region is also characterized by its young and vibrant population, uh, with around 45% of the population being below the age uh, of uh, 25. To me, this is synonymous with the new beginnings and optimism. Your presence here today and your uh, commitment is proof of that. The Middle East and North Africa is a priority region for Switzerland, owing to its uh, geographical proximity and uh, geopolitical significance. We share a strong historical and cultural heritage. Some of the countries in the region are key trading partners for Switzerland. During the past 12 months, I have personally visited no less than eight MENA countries in, an in my official capacity. Algeria, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, Israel and Palestine, the United Arab Emirates and of course Oman. And I intend to continue on this path. Supporting the needs of young people like uh, yourselves in the region is a clear priority for Switzerland. To achieve that, it is important for us to consider multiple factors, such as addressing inequalities, as well as supporting the entrepreneurial spirit of the region. In October last year, the Federal Council launched, that is the Swiss government, launched its first strategy, strategy on Middle East and North Africa. Indeed, 
we have brought copies of this uh, strategy with us in French, German, Italian, English, and a special an Arabic version I performed, I uh, made for my visit to Oman uh, uh, early uh, this year in April. Um, the strategy highlights both Switzerland's interest in the region as well as Swiss values. The MENA, the MENA region is very heterogeneous and characterized by great diversity. It is affected by long-term conflicts and at the same time displays a significant potential for economic development and innovation. Switzerland's approach takes these uh, diverse facets into account. Fostering peace, security and prosperity are at the heart of Switzerland's commitment to the region. With the help of new technologies and digitalization, we aim to find sustainable solutions that benefit the environment, the economy, and society at large. Finally, the strategy is also based on one simple tenet. When the MENA region thrives, so does Europe. Ten months after the release of the MENA strategy, we are on a good path uh, regarding its implementation. And together with our representations in the region, we aim to continue to work this work uh, and this work on its five focus areas. Peace, migration, sustainable development, economic affairs, and digitalization. To achieve these five goals, we have to count on our partners in the region. I am particularly honored to welcome today my Omani counterpart, uh, uh, His Excellency Said Badr al Buzaidi, here in Lugano on his first visit to Europe as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. The Sultanate of Oman is a very trusted partner of Switzerland, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, further increasing our cooperation. Our countries have a lot in common, both in our traditions of neutrality as well as in the role we play as a bridge builders in peace diplomacy. During my visit to Oman last April, I enjoyed the hospitality of this wonderful country, and it was during that visit that the idea uh, to come together in Lugano was born. I had the, the chance to meet uh, motivated young men and women in Oman. This conversation particularly inspired me. It was great to see how engaged they are for their country. I'm convinced that it is uh, with uh, and for the benefit of future generations, both in the MENA region and in Switzerland, that solutions for tomorrow can be found. In that sense, I would like to thank the Università della Svizzera Italiana for organizing the summit and for hosting us in Lugano. I am proud that the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, which is my tongue, is once again a privileged place of exchanging of exchanges among young people. Grazie a voi tutte e tutti for your contributions and for making this exchange possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Federal Councillor Cassis, for your very important words. You've been a firm backer of this initiative in your hometown, and we really appreciate that. Uh, thanks to a personal encounter this spring, you brought the Foreign Minister of the um, Sultanate of Oman. So I would like to introduce um, His Excellency Said Badr bin Hamad bin Hamoud al Busaidi. Ahlo sahla. Allah khalik, shukran, shukran. Yatik al afi. Mabsutin ktir and no hadatak bilugano. Ahlo sahla, and with no further ado, we would welcome you for your um, keynote speech. Thank you, Shukran. Minister. Shukran, jazeelan. Sabah al-khair. Wassalamu alaikum. I am uh, extremely uh, grateful uh, for the opportunity to, to be here, to participate in this summit. And uh, I want first to place on record my thanks to our hosts, uh, the Swiss Italian University, and to everyone involved uh, in organizing and preparing this for this event, including, of, of course, all the partners and sponsors and supporters. And 
indeed a very, very warm and special thanks to my friend and colleague, Vice President Minister Ignacio Casas. Thank you, and thank you for your kind remarks about uh, my country, about your visit. Uh, and I'm really delighted that I'm able to respond positively uh, on your kind invitation to, to come and see you here in your own town. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful place, uh, and uh, it is really warm, uh, it warms my heart to see the young uh, students from all over, uh, from the Middle East and elsewhere, joining together uh, here, uh, connecting, uh, interconnecting, communicating. This is a great thing. It is clear to me that uh, I share with you and I share with the organizers of this event an understanding of the range and seriousness of the challenges that the Middle East and the Mediterranean region faces. Indeed, I find it particularly useful to think about these challenges within the framework offered by this regional concept. Thinking about the interconnectedness of the Mediterranean and the Middle East helps us get beyond problematic distinctions in which the Middle East in isolation uh, keeps appearing as a location for unavoidable and historic antagonisms. It also helps us to think about the bright side of the region. As the director earlier said, look at what unites us. I think that is a very important, really, uh, objective. The long history of reciprocal influences and exchanges between the cultures and people of the region, and thereby to understand ourselves as part of a rich and diverse civilization, rather than as members of a different civilizations in conflict with one another. Never forget, in the Mediterranean, in the 15th and 16th century, the Renaissance was just as much a Muslim and Jewish cultural explosion as it, is, as it was Christian. I would like to take as my starting point the description of the current situation and recent turbulent developments in the region that is presented in the preparatory paper for this meeting uh, as an overview of the crisis we face today. This overview alerts us to divisions across the region, be it on Israel-Palestine issues to the challenges facing Europe as a result of refugees fleeing conflict zones to the need uh, for the U.S. administration to rebuild the trust of their regional allies. Clearly, there are divergent opinions on the potential for and approaches to a solution to the Palestine-Israel conflict. Some of these divergent opinions have made or have been made clear through the choice of some Arab states to make new diplomatic agreements with Israel, while others have chosen not to do so. This may reflect a situation in which there are some who believe that this conflict is best dealt with by engagement through full diplomatic relations with Israel, while others see little prospects for progress in this way and at this time. There are also still others who believe that dialogue is most certainly the way forward, but who do not judge that at this time, the kind of agreements forged as part of the Abraham Accords offer such a way forward. In other words, there are more 
than two positions or views. Mm -hmm. This is not a binary issue. More problematically, I think, it is unhelpful to characterize divisions on this and other issues in sectarian terms. For example, it makes no sense, to me at least, to speak of a so-called brother Shia axis. The perception that our region is divided between Sunnis and Shias is simply wrong and potentially quite damaging. It is important to take great care with the language we use, to avoid slipping into oversimplification uh, into accounts of the reality everyone is grappling with. The overview also highlights the challenge posed by the emergencies confronted by refugees, noting particularly those who are fleeing to Europe. This is, of course, a very immediate and pressing issue to which renewed global attention is now being paid as a result of the situation in Afghanistan. It is clearly an issue which requires a collective international effort to ensure that the burden is shared in a manner that is equitable and appropriate. As we do so, we will do well to remember which countries have shouldered a disproportionate share of this collective responsibility. For example, while the humanitarian efforts of European nations and organizations have been significant, the largest number of, by far, of refugees from the ongoing crisis in Syria have been welcomed by neighboring countries, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, where, regrettably, the capacity to provide them with basic needs, food, shelter, medical care, represents much more of a challenge to the economic and social infrastructure than it does in wealthier nations. I very much hope that in the face of the new refugee crisis created by the developments in Afghanistan, we can find ways as an international community of sharing this responsibility better. Sharing it better will ensure better care for those who are in the most desperate need. And finally, the overview refers to the need for the United States to regain the trust of its allies. Here I can at least point to some positive news. We have seen the United States agree uh, engagement uh, at the recent G7 summit and elsewhere with a number of vital global issues. And that is encouraging to see. And as a friend of the United States, the Sultanate of Oman has been encouraged by the commitment so far shown by the Biden administration in several fronts. This brings me to my larger point. These are all, to some extent, crises arising of what I think we can reasonably call failures in social justice. In order to address them, we need to think about the dimension of social justice, in addition to, or in some cases, instead of focusing on national, ideological, and sectarian positions and conflicts. There are broadly two quite different ways of approaching social justice. To put it in contemporary terms, it is the difference between people who occasionally making credit card donations in response to emergency television campaigns, and people making collective commitments to social welfare. 
There is a, a widely accepted contemporary understanding of charity, which is much closer to the idea of spontaneous and voluntary acts of giving than it is to the idea of collective obligation. It is discretionally rather than built into social and economic systems through taxation. Now, this understanding of charity has in some cases led some governments to believe that they can have or they can leave to the uh, religious organizations and other NGOs the task of compensating for social injustices. But in my view, this is insufficient. Governments have a duty to promote a planned and collective approach to social justice. This has a number of advantages. It places the obligation to resolve problems on those with resources and influence, rather than leaving this task to those who lack them. It deprives those without resources of justification for extremism. It emphasizes resources and values that people have in common rather than the divisions or separations between them. In other words, it represents precisely the opposite worldview to that espoused by extremists of all persuasions who insist on separation and purity rather than a common human heritage. So let us put this idea to a test. How should we think about the crisis in Afghanistan from a perspective shaped by an emphasis on social justice? First, we need to learn the lesson that political and security challenges have to be addressed by more than emergency interventions, even those which have explicitly humanitarian objectives. Then we also need to accept that whatever emergency response we make now to what seems certain to be a major refugee crisis, we will need to do more than respond to the immediate and highly visible emergency. Only a much stronger collective commitment to social justice will enable us to design institutional mechanisms through which effective collective action in support of the lives and aspirations of the Afghan people may be developed and implemented. This focus on justice and charity compels us to ask some questions which are not always the first to be addressed, but which, if left unanswered, will come back to haunt us over and over again. We need to ask ourselves, what are the social conditions, economic dislocations, and structural inequalities that create the situation in which Afghanistan finds itself today? And what can we do, led by the will, the ingenuity, and the creativity of the Afghan people themselves, to help change this situation and those conditions for the better? And how, in the meantime, can we engage constructively with the Taliban in such a way that they might actually contribute to solutions and be part of solutions? of the solutions. Like it or not, the last 25 years have shown beyond doubt that treating them only as an ideological enemy to be confronted is unlikely to succeed. Now, turning away from Afghanistan, what can we also do to avoid other situations in other countries where similar inequalities contribute to the emergence of political movement offering dangerous solutions. Can we find safe 
responsible solutions before crisis strikes and emergency intervention is the only remaining option. As I, compel, as I contemplate these questions in relation to the principles that underpin Omani foreign policy, I find myself facing a further rather difficult question. How can Oman participate in this kind of collective work while also continuing to abide by a policy of neutrality and non-interference? Mm. Or in other words, how are we to balance a policy of non-interference and neutrality with one that seeks to apply the principle that one should also always act as a good neighbor. I must also express our deep concern at the inequality of COVID vaccine distribution. How can it be right that in rich countries, some people are already getting third shots when the poor and the vulnerable across most of the world remain completely unprotected. As you'll see by now, I don't come to you with answers, but this is a forum for discussion and exchange. And I hope that opening up these questions will seem to you to be an appropriate use of our time together, and hopefully it will inspire you further to deepen our knowledge and understanding of some of these difficult and complex issues. I'll finish with one final thought. If we are to try to base the conduct of international relations on some shared understanding of and commitment to social justice, we will of course also need to think about how we connect this not just to vital practicalities like vaccine distribution, but also to the way we develop domestic policy more broadly. For the two are of course so deeply interrelated that it sometimes seems a mistake even to distinguish them from each other. I was personally very struck by the fact that Anthony Blinken made just this observation in some of his early remarks on being appointed as Secretary of State in Washington. It's clear already that the administration in which he serves sees America's vital place in the world as being underpinned by the renewed of an old commitment to making sure that every citizen of the United States enjoys the basic economic security to make a good life for themselves. In Oman, we are determined to do all that we can do and, and we can to ensure that Oman's foreign policy acts in the service also of social justice while at the same time making a contribution to a just social order at home, one in which those who enjoy wealth and privilege continue to play an appropriate role in securing the well-being of all. I think this is what the culture we all have in common demands of us. I really feel the positive energy of young people here and everywhere, wherever I go. And so allow me to make a final point and end by saying this. First of all, I am grateful to be with you. I think of your further days ahead, I think of your future 
just I uh, was blessed uh, in my younger days uh, uh, with the older generations thinking about my future. And I say it is the role of government to create a good economic context in which your talents may prosper. The long-term interests of the young would be best served if our economies are on the right footing. Even if that means, in the short and possibly the medium terms, some restraint on public spending and particular redistribution through taxation as a means to establish a new consensus based on social justice. This will create social unity, which is a win-win for all sections of society. But in particular, will, cre will create favorable conditions and opportunities for young people, for the youth. And with that, I wish you all the best of luck and thank you again for inviting me here today. Shukran jazilan, yatikilafia wazir al kharji al busaidi. I think you really planted many, many scenes of very inspiring and essential themes that we will also address in this uh, panel. And as you said, the young generation, the young change maker, then all are here in uh, Lugano representing all the others who have been here in the past and who will be here in the future. So I'm very pleased and honored uh, to invite two young changers present today, Fatma Men, uh, of, from Morocco and Momin uh, from Palestine. Please join us on stage. Ahlo <laughs> Sahla. So this is one of the essential um, moments of the MEM Summer Summit, to really have this direct um, uh, dialogue uh, between uh, world leaders and, um, and the young change makers. So thank you for the generosity also uh, of the excellencies of being open to questions directly uh, from the young change makers. So I would like to uh, ask Fatma if she had uh, a question she would like to uh, pose. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here in this panel with your excellencies. And I'm also very honored to represent my fellow um, young change makers. And my question is inspired by yesterday's session where we discussed around um, narratives and mobilities, be it the mobility of people or the mobility of ideas. And I would like to pose a question to your excellencies in this regard. Um, what would be your recommendations for the countries in the region um, in facilitating the mobility of young people in order to um, foster and champion intercultural dialogue and mutual understanding in the Middle East and Mediterranean region? Your Excellency, Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. How to foster mobility of people and ideas. Oof. This is a whole program. Um, actually, um, when I look back at my youth here in Lugano, it was at that time not possible uh, to go to move to Italy, to Milano for the airport, or to, uh, to France or to Germany without passing the borders, being controlled with a passport and uh, with uh, the goods you had with you. And um, we, uh, it was a long journey, but we decided to, uh, um, to find solution with the neighbor states that uh, uh, were merging into the European Union to, um, to have a, a kind of, of a free movement of people to pass the barriers free uh, of controls. And when we then 
reintroduce the controls at the borders because of COVID-19, young people like you just couldn't believe that it is possible. But this is uh, the time where I come from. It was my reality in, in the 60s and in the 70s last century. So um, one answer is, well, you have to find, you have to take political decisions in order to keep barriers open. Mm. And it was at that time um, a very special time because it was the time in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s where we are uh, increasingly uh, uh, capable of, uh, of communicating through uh, countries. It was the uh, ICT revolution. Um, it was suddenly possible to have internet from the 90s. So actually, it was the globalization movement. And this globalization movement brought these positive effects like uh, keeping off barriers uh, and, uh, and let people and ideas and goods and services uh, move uh, freely. Then we experienced the reaction of human being. A human being like you, me, and everybody here in this room, um, we need to have roots somewhere. We need to have borders. We need to have uh, our house with walls because we want to be protected, we want to be safe, we want to be at home. And this is a very animal need that we all have. And what we experienced uh, after that time was uh, re-discovering um, uh, the importance of borders, the nationalism and the side effects and the negative side effects of nationalism, in my eyes, uh, was a reaction of human being to the globalization. And this uh, up and down in the history is very typical for humankind. Uh, so what we have to find in order to answer your question is, uh, first of all, um, a legal framework that, is, that permits uh, people to move uh, without too many controls, of course. Uh, and the same for ideas, and the same for goods, and the same for services, and for capital. These fundamental freedoms are very important in order to create uh, a market-oriented society and uh, uh, people who can be interconnected, dis discussing together without having, uh, without, without delay. This is, this is the time frame is, is a problem. So again, I think once is the uh, political uh, uh, frame, uh, uh, the legal framework. The second is, of course, uh, um, technology. Technology allow us today to be here with 30 of you and maybe more than 100 uh, following us uh, virtually. This is also technical solution for interconnections. It was just not thinkable when I uh, uh, was 20 or 30. Uh, it was not thinkable to have a mobile phone and from everywhere to be able to call to somebody. I mean, this technology has enhanced quite a lot the possibility of, of, uh, of communicating. Third, uh, you have to want to be interconnected. Of course, this is a psychological dimension of every human being. Um, if you uh, realize that interconnections are a win-win situation for you and for other people, then we will, you want to do that. If you realize that they are a threat for your security, for your children, for your family, then you will stay away of that. So you see, there are many, I guess there are many um, um, indicators and, and there are many factors uh, capable of, uh, of bringing more interactions and uh, interconnections among people. When I, um, um, this is the last, last idea I have just in, in, in mind, when I last visited, uh, last April visited uh, uh, Oman and, and Iraq, I uh, met young women and men in Oman. I met young entrepreneurs in, in Baghdad, uh, in, a, in a stadium, um, who were very much interconnected. I couldn't imagine that uh, young people in, uh, in Iraq 
are as uh, good and connected as I discovered that evening uh, in order to launch their startups, their uh, firms, their ideas, their commerce, and so on. And um, this is, was actually uh, especially possible thanks to the uh, technology, uh, um, to the new technologies we have today. And uh, in Oman, um, uh, what, I, uh, what I heard from young people and men after the official meeting we had uh, was uh, once, uh, um, first thing maybe, uh, actually, they, they, they felt good in comparison of other countries in the region. And second, of course, they want to be more involved in the uh, state organization of Omani. They uh, uh, wanted to, uh, could play a, a more active role in the political institution. In, in, and this, it is what, what we call democracy. Mm. We firmly believe, of course, in democracy. And on the other side, uh, we have to be prudent and uh, humble with that. If we want to just introduce uh, by force democracy in Afghanistan, we see the results. It doesn't, I absolutely agree with you. It, it is just not possible. You can just imagine that uh, you can cancel a culture uh, that have been there for hundreds of years. So you have to go step by step and, and the people themselves have to, to do these steps. And what we can offer is exchange, is knowledge transfer, is uh, uh, um, uh, thinking together about that, but not much more, we, of course, uh, programs, money, so, but the revolution, the progress, the uh, steps ahead, up to you to do them. You are the people of those countries, and it's your duty to do that. I may, uh, obviously, I uh, fully support what uh, Minister Kasi says, but uh, if you were to come to Oman one day, inshallah, and visit me, the foreign ministry. We have a globe. You have seen it yes. in the middle and in the, in the heart of the ministry as you enter. And our motto about this globe is the fact that it is done where there are no borders. It's the vision that we hope to realize one, one day, if not in my generation, maybe in yours or the next one, one day where people are free to move and travel without the necessity of actually having even borders, like it used to be in the centuries ago. I mean, Ibn Battuta from Morocco, I think, <laughs> traveled to Oman and elsewhere uh, without even, I think, a document. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Really? So uh, I support, really, given this history, the freedom of movement and mobility between cultures and peoples. In fact, this very fact has always been the source of prosperity of the Omani people for centuries. As a seafaring nation, we have traveled the world all the way to Africa, to the Southeast Asia, China, even to, the, to New York, to the, in the western side. Uh, and, and, and that was a source of, uh, of building understanding, cultural connectivity, respect for other cultures, and of course trade, it brought with it trade and prosperity. So I'm very much supportive of this. In recent years, obviously it's unfortunate with the pandemic, it has caused uh, so many restrictions on this, but as the minister says, and uh, internet has allowed uh, people to remain connected at least, remain able to connect and exchange and build acquaintances and friendships and even uh, develop opportunities. Uh, uh, there are a lot of startups that have started as a result of this challenge of the pandemic, just by going online and uh, doing startups and, uh, uh, and actually uh, creating a profitable uh, business for young people through that route. So I'm very much really supportive and I hope uh, there would be more and more agreements to regulate travel between countries that make it easier and facilitate it better, like we have in Oman with so many countries, uh, which allows us to, allows Omanis to travel freely and vice versa. I mean, we have uh, agreements, for example, with Switzerland on, uh, on the exemption of visas on official passports. Uh, and we are working, for example, on 
uh, negotiating a similar agreement with the Schengen countries uh, for all citizens. So I think governments have a major role to really play uh, in, in the support of, 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 the, of freedom of movement and mobility. Shukran, thank you so much. Thank you, Fatima, for your question. Momin, uh, you have prepared a, a question as well. Good morning. Uh, my name is Momin. I'm from Palestine. First of all, I would like to welcome you here again. Uh, it's very nice to have you here, both of you. Uh, my question is more about the uh, main strategy of the Swiss Confederation, which is something was shared among us in the uh, summit. So we've took a look at it. So, um, um, so my, my question is directed to you, to your excellency, head of the Federal Department of the uh, Foreign Affairs. Um, as you are aware, and many of us are aware, in many and several Middle Eastern countries, we have several outdated laws and national legislations that undermine the status of women and their rights in their respective countries. And uh, this is something that I have been working on back at home, and I've seen so many problems in this aspect. We are also aware that many of these national legislations need to be amended and in some cases need to be repealed because they go so back into history and they do not meet up the needs of this age we're living at. Um, my question is, because the MENA strategy talks about the human rights policy uh, in the region, but I did not view or see much detail about what is the actual Swiss role in these countries in, in this regard, and uh, in which countries, for example, and if whether there has been an actual development, a positive impact that we as youth, young change makers can build on and capitalize on, given our limited partic political participation, and given that when we talk about, for example, Swiss technical support to national legislations, some of this, to be honest, some of this technical support or, or help can be imposed as can be seen as an imposed Western uh, values uh, from some tribes and clans within the Middle East region. Uh, so that's basically uh, my question. Thank you. Well, thank you. I uh, mentioned in my introducing remarks uh, that uh, we have uh, for uh, this uh, uh, MENA region actually five uh, uh, goals from. Uh, our perspective from Switzerland, of course, and these are peace, migration, sustainable development, economic affairs, and digitalization. Now, these five goals are not the same everywhere. The region is very heterogeneous, is very uh, diverse, and we have uh, to uh, define for uh, every country what are the specific goals for this country among the five we decided to have for the region. You find in, 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 in this strategy uh, for every one of the country of the main region uh, what we are intended to do, what we want to do. This is, this is I guess, not just new for Switzerland, but uh, this is quite new for uh, almost uh, the most countries on the world. I will be on Friday this week in Hungary in order to explain them the methods this is something which is very interesting for the academic world. How we decided to put into place uh, a mother strategy for a strategy of foreign affairs and then sub-strategies, geographical and, and thematical. Now, uh, what uh, do we want, which emphasis do we want to put on, uh, uh, on, uh, on, on, on Palestine, on, on the Israel-Palestine conflict? And then, well, you can, you can read it in the strategy, it is exactly described. What we want to put uh, there as emphasis is integration. Integration among young people. We do not believe that your parents and your grandfather are able to speak together, Israeli and Palestine. It, it's just not possible because there is hate there. But we firmly believe that uh, we uh, if we are doing something like uh, um, uh, um, a start-up uh, uh, um, uh, 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 project uh, or, uh, or a biotop of, uh, of, uh, uh, um, of, of, uh, of, of, of instruments and ways to, 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 to foster uh, startups, the startups enterprises. Well, this is a good way. This is the reason why I met in Baghdad these uh, young entrepreneurs in order to 
um, to find an idea which they have in common. We, we've heard from the director of the Università della Svizzera Italiana, we have to work on what we have in common, not uh, uh, on, what, uh, on what divides us. And, and, and I really realized there how much integrated they could think uh, beyond uh, the uh, ethnic uh, or, uh, or, uh, or very local uh, mentalities. And we are aware that in uh, uh, Israel and Palestine, we have many young people already working together, not caring about uh, you're a Palestinian, I'm an Israeli, but, but just wanting to, to, to do business together and uh, to, 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 to build uh, on the, the intelligence, on, on the capacity of, uh, of these people uh, to make their business, to make uh, then the family, to, to, to further develop in, in, in the family. We have uh, concentrated our efforts in, uh, in, 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 in the occupied territories, how we call it formally, uh, and, and um, in order to, 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 to boost this, this development, and to uh, educate young people like you not to think about the conflict, but to think about the opportunity. And the best way is, is just to do it with a project, with, by creating something that is important for you and your family. Would you like to add something? To I just this? want to say uh, uh, it's a very important and relevant question to many countries in the region. And I think you've, you've really highlighted the, what is one of the key issues that are at the, up, you know, the front of the minds of young people nowadays everywhere. Uh, but I fully agree that I think young people uh, should not shy away from uh, 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 rising to that challenge by connecting and leading by example and focusing on opportunities that can demonstrate the benefit that comes to the society by working together, men and women, uh, and obviously influencing uh, governments uh, and influencing even some of the old-fashioned or uh, traditions that somehow discriminates between men and women, which is obviously uh, irrelevant uh, 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 to, to us and to you. Uh, and and uh, I will give you an example. Uh, in Oman, for example, it's a bi our basic law in the constitution of Oman. There is gender equality by law. It's guaranteed by law. But the problem is, lies here, is in the traditions, some of the still old tribal traditions that needs to be observed and sometimes can be classified as discriminatory and it's uh, actually uh, probably violates even the, 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 the constitution. Uh, but it's a constant process of education, of uh, the government taking the lead in giving equal opportunities to both men and women in politics, in in education, in, in jobs, uh, availability, um, uh, and elsewhere, I mean, across board. So I think uh, there are good examples and successful examples one can look at, uh, but I think young people everywhere nowadays are uh, with their capacity and ingenuity and ability to connect with young people elsewhere can really build a, a, a constitu constituency of of, of, of progress uh, and constructiveness and building opportunities together. That's the way forward. Please, I, just very Please, please, just, uh, please. Just, uh, just an example, because I, did, uh, I, I forgot to mention it. Uh, the Gaza Strip is not the most pacific word, place in the world today. And nevertheless, we are present there uh, we don't have any, any fear to be present then and to support uh, a startup's uh, um, uh, environment to create new firms and new jobs. And we already created more than 200 jobs there uh, just in, in the few months, despite every difficulty you can just imagine. Uh, this is so much distraction and, and so on. But again, uh, looking ahead, hoping for the future uh, and not looking back uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and losing themselves in hate and, and, and desperation. So looking ahead uh, uh, in a constructive way and, and try to find, to speak with, uh, with, your, uh, with your colleagues, uh, even they're coming from Israel or from them, about your ideas. 
and not the origin of the world and Adam and Eva. I know it is important, the origin of the world, but you can comment later on. Uh, do first what it is important, and then you can make a little bit philosophy. Thank you so much. I think uh, these uh, closing words and this short uh, dialogue between uh, your excellencies and the young change maker in representation of all the change makers here in Lugano who have been discussing in the seminar, um, I think we really made a wonderful opening round of essential themes of the region, of really what the uh, director has said as well, st stressing that uh, what unites us is stronger than what divides us. And very, very important uh, concepts, uh, like you said, social justice, dignity, um, you know, charity or humanitarian uh, traditions like we have in Switzerland as well. All these are the important concepts that will also guide us through this program uh, today. So. Thank you so much for this very nourishing, inspiring uh, first panel. I'm happy to thank you again for your participation, for the openness, for the generosity of your time of coming here to Lugano. So, ahla sahla again. And um, I would like to introduce a short video with some impressions of this seminar that has been going on all week uh, here in Lugano uh, with the 30 change makers, so thank you. The seminar of the MEM Summer Summit is devoted to us. The young change makers. To the innovators. The dreamers. For the ones who are ready to work hard. Coming from all over the MEM region to focus on what unites us. Not what divides us. We are here in Lugano, Ticino, Switzerland, at the Università della Svizzera Italiana. In a safe space. To debate, to exchange ideas. To learn. To raise a challenging questions. Establish a strong network of change makers. And establishing long-lasting friendships. So this short video uh, that you saw with all the participant, participants of the seminar gives us a greater idea of how important it is to actually meet up and have a safe space here in Lugano uh, to talk, to have a dialogue, to have an exchange in person. These are just invaluable moments and we're very happy uh, for uh, the Università della Svizzera Italiana to offer this platform. Now I would like to introduce another video message, this time by Ger Otto Pedersen. He is the UN Special Envoy for Syria, um, a Norwegian citizen, and he's been the Special Envoy uh, since October 2018. Please. Excellencies, dear participants, I thank you for the invitation today to share a video message as you are gathering in Lugano to explore new approaches in the response to persisting challenges in the region. Let me also take this opportunity to express my thanks to Switzerland and for all that it does to support the work of my office and the search for peace in Syria. As the Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for Syria, my job, of course, is to work with the parties, the government, and the opposition to help them move towards a lasting political settlement that meets the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people and restores Syria's sovereignty, unity, independence, and territorial integrity. That is the mandate that the Security Council has entrusted me with. This is not an easy task, especially as Syria has now experienced over a decade of brutal conflict with dramatic consequences for the Syrian people, with thousands killed, injured, detained, tortured and disappeared. Millions inside the country and the 6.6 .6 million of refugees outside 
are grappling with deep trauma, dwindling poverty, personal insecurity, and a lack of hope for the future. The country, as you know, has been destroyed to a large extent, including most basic infrastructures like hospitals, schools, electricity, water and sanitation, with devastating consequences for the provision of essential services to millions of Syrians. I have shared with Security Council members what I see as the biggest danger for this conflict, that it could last for another 10 years, prolonging one of the greatest humanitarian crises of this century, with no hopes for the refugees and IDPs to return home in safety and dignity, and leaving an entire population subject to abuses, violence, terror, and an economic nightmare with Syrian and women and children paying a particularly high price. This would also be a major threat to regional stability and a breeding ground for extremism. Regrettably, the political process has not, however, delivered what the Syrian people so desperately need. The mistrust between the Syrian players is deep. So too is the extent of regional and international differences over Syria, and five foreign armies continue to jostle inside Syria. Syrian territory is split into a number of de facto zones, and while there has been a strategic military stalemate for the last 16 months, this stalemate remains fragile and destructive, with active warfare across the front lines, killing and displacing civilians. We've recently seen new fighting in the south of Syria, and deadly violence continues in the northwest, claiming the lives of dozens of women and children. And yet, the re the reality on the ground is that no one actor can achieve victory or dictate the political outcome of the conflict. It therefore continues to be my hope that this realization will motivate all involved to work more seriously for a political settlement through the UN-facilitated political process. Recently, the Security Council came together on Syria for the first time in a long time to pass an important humanitarian resolution, showing that international cooperation is indeed possible. And I will continue to do all I can to urge all Syrian and international players to build cooperation where they can. In that spirit, I have asked all parties to work with me on exploratory discussions on a package of small, concrete steps that, above all, help save Syrian lives, ease suffering and promote regional stability. These steps could include de-escalation and nationwide ceasefire, counter-terrorism cooperation, actions on detainees, abductees and missing persons, mitigating the humanitarian effects of the economic crisis, helping to create conditions for safe, dignified and voluntary refugee returns. I also continue my efforts to facilitate the intra-Syrian political process in Geneva with the Constitutional Committee mandated to prepare and draft for pop popular approval a constitutional reform followed by elections. I want to end my message by underlining the role of Syrian women youth and civil society that continue to inspire me and to engage with me and my office for a political resolution of the conflict as the only means to put the country back together again. There is a sense that this is not just desirable but possible and that the United Nations must preserve and facilitate the political process for the purpose of achieving a sustainable peace with a meaningful participation of Syrian women and with the women's safety, basic needs, dignity, rights and equality at its core. There is also a sense that, at this juncture, the most important priority should be to address the issues that cause more and more daily suffering to Syrians themselves. And there is a very strong sense that many of the issues have fallen out of Syrian hands 
and require international attention. I want to thank all of them for their courage, resilience and actions and to remain engaged with me through our civil society support room and the Women's Advisory Board. I thank you for your kind attention and wish you a successful meeting. I'm very honored to introduce this first panel of today's uh, forum. And the th theme is new geopolitical configurations in the MEM region. Our panelists will discuss some recent developments in the area, uh, some very current present issues, uh, or also like the Abraham Accords, or new directions of the Biden administration, for instance. The main speech will be delivered to us by distinguished Royal Highness Prince Turki El Faisal. He's the chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. So, ahla wa sahla, very happy to have him connected today via Skype. The second panelist is uh, Professor Gilles Kepel, professor of l'Università della Svizzera Italiana and PSL Paris Sciences et Lettres École Normale Supérieure à Paris. Very warm welcome here in Lugano. The chairman of the panel uh, will be or is uh, Matteo Legrenzi. Uh, he's a professor of international relations at the Ca Foscari University of uh, Venice. And I'm very pleased to have the two young change makers on stage as well. Uh, we have Reem from Abu Dhabi and Ala from Libya. So, ahla wa sahla, kullum, very happy to listen to this first panel. Please. Thank you, Professor Boaz Erez, uh, President of the University of Lugano, and Professor Gilles Kepel, Chairperson of Cher Moyen Orient Mediterranean, for inviting me to speak to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been witnessing during the last few weeks an unfolding drama in Afghanistan, indicating an end to an era. The era of foreign military intervention to constitute or shape countries according to a foreign design is doomed. Democratizing and state building, if not indigenous and reflects the national cultures and aspirations, are not suitable and not sustainable and remain alien to the subjected proud societies. This must be the first lesson learned from this experience in Afghanistan and the other failed experience in Iraq. However, the perceived failure or defeat of a great power, the United States and the greatest military alliance, NATO, will have its long lasting impact on the strategic configuration in the regions close to Afghanistan and maybe on the overall regional and international power politics. Afghanistan must not be abandoned and pushed to be isolated, but it is to be engaged to avoid the danger of being played out by neighboring countries in their search for building power blocks. Pakistan, Iran, China, and Russia come to mind in this respect. Undoubtedly, such development with uncertainty regarding American presence and role in the region will impact the overall balance of power in the Middle East. Allies and friends of the US and the West in general will be rethinking and reconsidering their future away from the Western dominant paradigm that dominated the geopolitics of the region during the last few decades. The impact of the defeat and withdrawal of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan in 1989 changed the world then. Questions about the impact of this development on the United States the Western countries and the world at large remain to be seen. This experience in Afghanistan reflects a strategic confusion facing the world. The world and its regions are facing immense challenges which, if not met responsibly by the community of states, particularly by great powers, the world will continue living in a state of uncertainty that threatens its future and the human progress that was achieved during the last few decades in all fields. The most dangerous threats nowadays are the state of polarization in world politics and the vacuum in the international leadership. Let us hope that what has happened in Afghanistan 
will not widen this state of polarization and vacuum, that dominant power for the last seven, seven decades. Therefore, doubts about the, its role and commitments to preserve regional security are accumulating and resulting in a combined strategic regional confusion and more conflicts and crises. Victimizing the region again in a new Cold War based on the principles of power politics is not an answer to the region's conflicts and crises. The United States and China are keen, according to their official statements, to avoid such a Cold War. But policies indicate the opposite direction. However, regional states in the Middle East must find their own approach to reconstruct a regional order that serves their national interests and preserves regional peace and security. This is a complicated issue, considering ongoing crises and conflicts, but there is no alternative to avoid any ramification of continued polarization and uncertainty of international politics and any future power politics between great powers. The strategic importance of the Middle East is still holding, and its countries need to be put in a situation I need not to be put in a situation to choose between great powers involved in a strategic contest. While it is hard to envision the future of geopolitics in the region at this turn of time, a new world order is needed to be envisioned. Such uh, this polarization, ladies and gentlemen, and uncertainty and vacuum in, in, in global leadership are symptoms of a deep structural problem and the existing order caused by the failure of our world community to live to the principles of world good governance as set in the Charter of the United Nations 75 years ago. International order envisaged by the victors of the Second World War to preserve peace and security of the world is now in crisis and failing to respond to the crisis and risks facing humanity. Our interdependent and globalized world is not the world of 1945, but it is still managed by the mentality of 1945 and the mentality of the Cold War. International order needs restructuring to be fair, inclusive, and reflective of international reality, where power in all its aspects is shared by many power centers. The world is so conscious of unfairness and the present order and sees it as an outdated structure and not being able to tackle the issues of the day. Without such restructuring, geopolitical risks will continue to rise and threaten world peace and security. As we have seen in many crises, the failure of the international community and especially the failure of great powers in reaching consensus in addressing, addressing crises facing our world is the constant rather than the exception. The world order does not need a new world war to have a new world order to prove that world orders in history are byproducts of major wars. Therefore, reforming the present order requires new thinking by all UN member states, including the five permanent V2 members. The sustainable international order that can preserve peace and security in the world and that can meet the pressing challenges and threats facing humanity must be an equitable and representative one. The world order not, does not need to be divided again under the banners of democracy or autocracy or any other mantras and therefore dividing regions and countries accordingly. World leaders need to come to their senses. Europe can play a major role in convincing great powers to play their politics within a reformed world order that serves the interests of all and preserves peace and security for all. There must be no going back to the play of power politics and selfish aggrandizement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your uh, Royal Highness, uh, for uh, uh, such a vision and such uh, developments. Uh, I, do, I do remember uh, how uh, a few years ago already, together with the King Faisal Center for, uh, for Research and Studies, uh, within the frame of what was at the time the Eurogolf Initiative, we tried to, to bridge the gaps between uh, the different uh, shores of the Mediterranean and, uh, and the Gulf. And uh, this initiative, of course, is taking a new impetus today. Uh, when we had thought about uh, this panel, we were thinking ahead of the 
commemoration, I should not say celebration, of course, of 9-11. Uh, it would, was a sort of 20 years after event. Well, uh, this commemoration is, was anticipated to some extent and uh, put back on the front burner, if I may say so, with the recent uh, fall of Kabul to the children of the previous Taliban and uh, the retreat, if I may say so, of the United States which is to some extent both consonant with the uh, flight of the Soviet, of the Red Army uh, from Kabul, uh, this very same city, on the 15th of February, 1989, and also uh, brings back images from uh, the flight of the US from Saigon uh, in 1975. Now, um, what I would... Um, like to, to question, uh, following up with what uh, Prince uh, Turki uh, suggested, is uh, to what extent within this new world order which is taking shape, and I, I do share uh, your view, your uh, highness, about uh, the fact that to some extent uh, what happened in Kabul uh, is, is a watershed uh, event for us. I mean, it is something which, of course, impacts uh, both uh, the trust of the allies of the United States in its capacity uh, to uh, defend them, if uh, need be. And um, as you know, this is a debate which is already raging in Europe today, with some, like President uh, Macron, uh, asking for more autonomy for uh, Europe in terms of foreign policy and of a defense policy. I, let me refer to his famous interview to The Economist that uh, characterized the NATO as brain dead, and whereas other countries in Europe are more reluctant uh, to that, and they think that there is no way outside the uh, American umbrella militarily because uh, building a defense policy in common, be, be building a common diplomacy is costly, is complicated, and uh, this is one of the big issues. But as far as uh, Europe and the Middle East uh, and uh, North Africa are concerned, uh, what happened in Kabul reminds us that all around the Mediterranean east, west, uh, north, and south, we share uh, a, common, a common fate. This is not just, you know, uh, using uh, hollow, uh, hollow words, uh, uh, but uh, the Mediterranean has always been, including uh, the Gulf to some extent, the Red Sea and, uh, and the Gulf, uh, has uh, always been a sort of a twofold uh, carriageway. Uh, on the one hand, it was a conduit for an exchange of uh, ideas, of goods, and many things that you know have contributed to the progress of mankind, including what is on our table today, uh, for, from the break from breakfast to dinner. Uh, but it was also a, a major place for warfare, for immigration being uh, accepted or forced, and uh, with. The, this watershed year that we are watching, and uh, something that you know was already present uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Springs, uh, we definitely need to have a much more important coordination at the regional matter. And therefore, I would uh, follow up on uh, Prince Turkey's uh, vision that uh, Europe after it has united, and maybe it is one of the many reasons why it should be far more united, has to develop a special relationship, to quote unquote, with, uh, with the Middle East and North Africa, uh, and to, to rethink it, because uh, as, we, as, we, as we saw, uh, the capacity of world powers to guarantee peace and uh, to uh, help us uh, overcome our uh, difficulties uh, is now uh, taken to, uh, to, to question. Now, 
I would like to uh, to end up here and uh, to leave uh, more more time for uh, our uh, conversation, including with uh, with the young uh, change makers, the very bright young change makers who gathered uh, this year in uh, in Lugano, um, in uh, sort of um, asking. Uh, maybe directly to, to Prince Turki and uh, then uh, my colleague uh, Matteo Legrenzi from uh, Ca' Foscari University in Venice, Venice being a symbol uh, of what I'm uh, advocating. I mean, this Venice was the, the door to the Orient and also the recipient of the Orient, the, tr the introducer of, of much that came from the Orient into, into European culture and civilizations. Uh, to what extent uh, do you think that it would be realistic to build uh, an alliance, uh, even a military alliance, a defense alliance, between GCC country and, and, and Europe? Uh, our colleague, Rory Stewart, who was a former uh, minister uh, in uh, Mrs. May's cabinet and uh, uh, also an Orientalist, uh, whom you know well, uh, recently published a column uh, in one of the British newspapers saying that uh, he was in, in doubt whether Europe was in the capacity to, to, to build a, a cohesive defense uh, without American help. Do you think this would be feasible, uh, Your Highness? Uh, would you, do you think that the, the Kingdom and uh, other GCC countries would be interested in developing a closer uh, defense and uh, more coordinated uh, diplomacy between, uh, between the GCC and the, and the EU? Uh, this may be one of the many questions that we could tackle during this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kepel. Um, the GCC has its own problems vis-a-vis -vis, uh, defense arrangements. Uh, this has been going on for some time. And uh, before resolving those issues, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to engage with others, uh, whether in Europe or as a NATO or, or other uh, form of alliance or any other uh, regional or international organization. Um, the GCC must put its house in order first. And uh, the, unfortunately, the, the influences around the GCC are such that uh, they have, uh, I would not say perhaps intentionally, but definitely events did not help in, in bringing the GCC together uh, for, for some time. Uh, since the Al-Ula uh, summit, uh, which was held in Saudi Arabia last winter, uh, that brought together the GCC again and um, re uh, in, encompassed uh, Qatar, uh, which had been boycotted uh, for a few years before that. Uh, I think the first step has been taken to, to get the GCC to put its house in order. But the GCC has many challenges around it, uh, not just uh, uh, from, from within the GCC, but from around it. If you look at the, the ambitions of countries like Iran and Turkey, for example, that have uh, expanded their interference in Arab affairs over the last decade, if not longer. Uh, that is a challenge that has to be resolved uh, before there can be uh, a regional setup that can then go on to cooperate with other uh, regional setups, whether in Europe or, or elsewhere. So it's a tall order that is required from us in the GCC. Of course, I cannot speak for Europe. Uh, I see Europe has its own issues, but uh, I, this is my personal view. And I think uh, our leaders are aware of the, of the, of the dangers uh, around us. And therefore, uh, the, the Al-Ula summit, as I mentioned, is, is really the first step in, in, in going forward uh, on, an, on, a, on a policy and, and uh, a program of uh, strengthening the ties that bind uh, the countries of the GCC. Thank you, Your uh, Royal Highness, uh, uh, for the candor and the sharpness of your remarks. I mean, uh, you certainly do not 
um, remember this, but I actually interviewed you for my d field that was a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away on the GCC. And uh, you were then, as you are now, one of the decision makers who can speak his mind and sort of like give us a valuable food for thought. So in line I am with... I uh, Your Excellency, if you may <laughs> find me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's very satisfying and it's it's really excellent uh, for our own purposes today. So in line with what you just said, I mean, and, you know, bringing the, fo uh, the focus onto the Gulf, do you think that in this new post uh, sort of like um, Kabul era, do you see the possibility of uh, indeed GCC states and other Arab states embarking into a dialogue, an autonomous dialogue with Iran? How do you see the situation there? Because if you are trying to sort of get away or get a little bit less dependent, both in Europe and in the Middle East on the American hegemony, one could see this as uh, something uh, desirable and indeed necessary. So how do you see the prospect of like an autonomous GCC and Arab dialogue with Iran? Uh, well, I can, I can speak about what Saudi Arabia has been doing better than I can for the other GCC because it has been published. Uh, there are contacts now between Saudi authorities and Iranian authorities that have taken place over the past few months uh, in places like uh, Iraq and, and, uh, and Oman. Uh, nothing has come out of those uh, talks yet. Uh, what I heard from uh, publicly from from uh, Saudi foreign minister, for example, is that uh, uh, there are uh, certain issues that in Iran's conduct in the area uh, that need to be resolved be before there can be progress. I heard from the Iranian side, uh, uh, the Raisi, for example, and his, his designated foreign minister now uh, uh, say that uh, there are no issues that should impede a good relations between uh, particularly Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. So if, if both these, these statements can be uh, um, dissected and, and, uh, and uh, analyzed, I think they show that there is goodwill in order to achieve some kind of, of understanding with Iran, but that for that to take place, uh, much, much has to be done. I'll just give you one example. Uh, in Yemen, for example, uh, which is right in the heart of the Arabian Peninsula, and in the past, uh, I remember I, I, I suggested um, very, very strongly that uh, Yemen should be included in the GCC. This was uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, I think if we had done that at that time, we would not be facing the situation in Yemen now. But there we see a civil war inside Yemen uh, where the legitimate government, which is recognized by the world and which has been supported by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216 and other such uh, UN uh, resolutions, um, faces a rebellion within its own borders uh, and has called for support from the world community. Uh, in return for that, uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries in the area uh, formed a coalition to help the legitimate government face this revolt, armed revolt, by uh, one of the components of Yemeni society. Unfortunately, the United Nations Security Council resolution, which called for an arms embargo on this rebellious part of, uh, of Yemeni society uh, has not been followed by Iran. Iran is still exporting weapons and support to this rebellious group, which are the Houthis. And that is just one issue that uh, is, is blocking any potential for uh, agreement between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and other countries in the area with, with Iran. So if, if only the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216 was implemented, then there would be a chance for, for some, some sort of progress forward. And uh, therefore, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, and as our foreign minister, as I said before, uh, has, has uh, also stated, there are still issues that uh, have to be resolved between Saudi Arabia and Iran before we can look forward to uh, a more 
um, uh, amenable and a more um, uh, cooperative engagement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, before like giving the word to our like uh, young change makers, I would like to ask uh, both His Royal Highness and Professor Kepel, what what do you think the future of NATO is, particularly in light of the fact that now President uh, Erdogan is dealing his own cards? So, what is your view uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? How do you see this uh, sort of organization? That's a, that's a tall question, and I think, uh, as we see from from uh, the Secretary General of NATO itself in his, in, in his recent statements, uh, he says that that NATO uh, is facing a crisis. And as Professor Kepel uh, referred to President Macron's statement about NATO, uh, that is a, that is a very indicative of the fact that NATO needs to be re envisioned by its components. Uh, you're right in saying that Turkey has, has, has uh, if you like, we have a saying in Arabic uh, which says, uh, 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 a bird chirps outside its flock. And, and definitely uh, Turkey under President Erdogan has uh, uh, veered a bit outside of, of, of NATO's uh, usual or historic uh, common positions on, on, on many things. So uh, as, as, as a potential ally, if you like, or, or supporter of, of a grouping like the GCC, NATO has to put its house in order before it can be uh, engaged with uh, to a satisfactory uh, level of cooperation uh, with the GCC. Well, I, I would um, fully agree with uh, with Prince Turkey on on this uh, issue, and uh, from uh, from a European perspective, um, I believe that uh, you know what happens with Turkey is uh, sort of very significant of what is happening now uh, that sort of uh, was exemplified by the fall of Kabul, i.e., no one is afraid of America anymore. And uh, Turkey can, Mr. Erdogan's Turkey can be simultaneously a member of NATO, buy S-400 uh, ground-to-air missiles from, uh, from Russia, uh, and then uh, re-Islamize uh, Hagia Sophia uh, and have uh, a very uh, um, hostile uh, statements towards a number of things that, is, that are happening in, within uh, European countries. And um, so this is definitely a problem in the sort of post-World uh, War II uh, order. Uh, you mentioned, um, Your Royal Highness, that uh, we are not uh, in 1945 anymore, that we still have a 1945 mentality. Uh, our institutions are still molded by 1945. Uh, but a number of actors of, uh, have understood that they can uh, use that to their benefit and uh, play on, uh, on, different, uh, on different tables at the same time which is, of course, a matter for, for, major, for major uncertainty. And um, uh, there again, uh, this is why I was uh, interested in sort of trying to see, maybe I should reformulate my original question that you rightly uh, said that the GCC has to place its house in order, that Europe also has to place its house in order, that NATO has to. Uh, to what extent um, it would not be interest interesting to develop a sort of, uh, of uh, transient sort of goodwill policy uh, with regular contacts bef between countries all around the Mediterranean who share common interests? And uh, this, I, I, I wonder, uh, could, uh, could be a rather uh, interesting way to sort of, uh, if not break the ice, at least uh, build uh, proposals uh, that to, to, what, uh, to what others uh, could be committed. What's, what would, you, what you would be your view on that, if I may ask? Well, that, that is already happening. 
in my view. Um, uh, as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, uh, it has set up consultation agreements with various European countries, <clears throat> the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, I think Germany also, uh, Italy, uh, and, and other countries uh, are, are consulting with Saudi Arabia on, on issues of, uh, of importance uh, to, to both Saudi Arabia and these European countries. Um, a more formalized uh, relationship, as I said, will, will require uh, a better setup within the regional frameworks, whether it is the GCC, the European Union, or NATO. But on, on an individual basis, definitely Saudi Arabia uh, has practiced rather than simply preached uh, the, the, the principle of, uh, of coordination and consultation with uh, uh, their friends in, in, in Europe and in other places. And uh, whether it is on, on, on issues like, uh, like Lebanon, like Palestine, like Iraq, like Yemen, and now, of course, uh, uh, the, the tragedy of, 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 of Afghanistan, which continues. Uh, and I, I just want to mention one thing about Afghanistan. What, what really pains me is that uh, over the last 40 years, basically, um, uh, it is the Afghan people who have paid the price of what is happening there. Uh, they're the ones who are being killed. They're the ones who are, who are driven from their homes. They're the ones who face hunger and disease and so on. And that is uh, unacceptable. And, you know, it is true that, that people trying to get out of Afghanistan now find difficulty in finding uh, planes to fly away from, from Afghanistan and the problem. But once they do, those left behind will continue to suffer and, uh, and uh, pay the price of, of the power politics that have uh, degenerated into uh, a humanitarian crisis of, of, of immense magnitude. So uh, that is something that has to be uh, looked at more, more, more closely and, and something done about it. Thank you so much. And now for our change makers. Um, Reem, please, I'm sure you have a question and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum, uh, Your Royal Highness uh, Turkey Al Faisal. Let me start by saying that to you, as a person with massive experience, uh, that uh, across many, many decades is a role model not only to a person coming from the United Arab Emirates, but for every youth across the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can kindly give us a piece of advice for the youth. Uh, in the Gulf Cooperation Council and in the MEM region as a whole. Thank you. Shukran uh, Jazeelan, first of all, for, for your kind words about me. Um, I, I dare not give advice when I certainly feel that I need a lot of advice myself. Uh, but what I can observe uh, is that um, consistency and, uh, and uh, dedication are, in my view, the key word to uh, progress and development. And definitely the youth today have all the available means in their hands. Um, this is what you have that my generation did not have growing up. Uh, it has all the knowledge of the world in your hands. And it, it's there for the taking. And please take it. Don't hesitate. And uh, that is something I think I see fabulous examples of that in the Emirates and other places in the area and Saudi Arabia and the other GCC countries of young people going forward and developing their own uh, identity and their own contribution to society. Just look at the, 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 the tremendous amount that is done by volunteers. Uh, on issues, whether it is health, uh, hunger, uh, housing, uh, services to, 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 the, uh, to the communities. These are hallmarks of what the youth today in our part of the world 
uh, has taken advantage of this tool that I just showed you uh, in order to serve others. And you, as a representative of that generation, definitely, I'm sure, is, is, is better equipped and better uh, able to contribute to humanity than, uh, than uh, you may think you have the right to or the ability to do that. So please, Yanni, knock on all doors. Don't leave a window you ha you, that is uh, closed. Uh, open all windows to, to, to the rest of the world and make something of yourselves that uh, will help uh, us uh, as senior citizens, if I may uh, rest assured that the future is in good hands. Thank you so much for this note of hope. Hala. <laughs> Assalamu <laughs> uh, alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Prince uh, King uh, Turkey Faisal, for giving me this opportunity to ask you the questions. Um, through your experience and understanding the, the current uh, challenges and that exist in the Middle East, uh, do you think the rising of uh, Taliban and uh, took over the authority and the power in Afghanistan that will be uh, shape a threat on the peace and security and stability of the Middle East. And as a youth, uh, how we can deal with all these the current uh, challenges and uh, the issues that exist in our region? Thank you. Well, the, the Taliban has been around for some time. And uh, as far as, as, as they have proclaimed since taking over in Kabul now, uh, that uh, they are not the Taliban that were in power in the 1990s, that they have changed their, 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 their idea of how to deal with issues, not just in, 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 in Afghanistan, but even outside Afghanistan. We still have to wait and see how they act on that statement. Uh, it is still too early to, to judge whether they are sincere or is it simply sweet words that they are uh, producing in order to gain acceptance and legitimacy from the world community. But they have a responsibility to their own people. Uh, you know, the, the, the Taliban, when, when, when they, uh, they allied themselves with someone like Osama bin Laden, and uh, especially after what he did, uh, you know, from, from under Taliban protection, in, in the 1990s, and they still hold that alliance with Al-Qaeda, uh, I am a bit wary about where they may head in the next uh, time, in the next future. Um, this is something that we'll have to wait and see. You know, during the, the, the negotiations between the Taliban and uh, President Karzai and then President Ghani in Afghanistan, um, the kingdom received delegations from the Taliban who, and from the governments uh, then existing in Afghanistan for, uh, um, uh, to play a role of mediation between them. But uh, the kingdom always insisted upon the Taliban that they must break with the connection to the terrorist activities and organization called Al-Qaeda. Unfortunately, uh, the Taliban did not accept that, uh, that uh, condition by, by Saudi Arabia. So the kingdom did not play a role in, 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 the, in the negotiations. But uh, definitely the, the, the countries that I mentioned in my presentation, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, and China, have an, uh, an obligation to the rest of the world to make sure that the Taliban stick to their statements about their changed attitude towards issues in Afghanistan. And um, it, it is these countries that have the major influence now inside Afghanistan, uh, with the departure of the United States and the, the NATO uh, alliance from, from Afghanistan. And we'll have to wait and see how they deal uh, with, the, with the Taliban. Thank you very much indeed. This was, I think, an enlightening session. I'm very glad to see that uh, Prince Tursky's remarks uh, maintain their sharpness and their candor, their directness. So thank you. This was extremely informative. 
So um, it is a real honor for me to have chaired this first session of a Mediterranean meeting this year. And I thank you, Professor Kepel, Prince Turki, and our so change makers for having participated. Thank you very much indeed. If I may, just one last word, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, Absolutely. Please excuse, please excuse my, my attire. It is uh, based on the fact that I am uh, not only retired from, from, from government work, but also I'm enjoying a bit of holiday after the two years of incarceration as a result of COVID-19. So uh, I hope you, you didn't think of me as, as being either, uh, you know, uh, offensive or any other uh, um, designation that you may uh, attribute to, to my very uh, easygoing uh, attire that I'm presenting myself with in front of such a distinguished audience. As long as you're not an inmate in Guantanamo, we, we're, we're relieved. So. <laughs> Absolutely. A picture of uh, activism and youth and energy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. a lot. Have a good day. Shukran. Shukran Jazilan, uh, Your Royal Highness. We're very honored and pleased to have had your wise and refreshing inputs uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia as well, not only to the youth, share, but also to the professors. We all... Afwan? We share a similar taste in colors. Exactly. Very matching. <laughs> <laughs> so, inshallah, we'll try that out in, in Riyadh one inshallah. day. So, uh, the panel was very, very inspiring. I think, you know, with uh, Your Royal Highness um, giving the ideas of really needing uh, uh, reform of the world order in order to address present issues as we uh, have heard uh, Afghanistan uh, all the first uh, steps uh, that are uh, happening also within the GCC are very very important so also the first steps of having uh, you know uh, after the Alula uh, summit um, that Qatar uh, the, the boycott has been lifted and also the first steps of Saudi Arabia having um, you know uh, first talks with Iran are signs that things are happening still maybe behind the scenes but uh, there is a will to go towards a better future. And I think with all the nations uh, doing their um, responsibility in that, um, in that sense, in order to have peace and security for all, and especially for the next generation. I think this is um, not only uh, the case in the MENA region, but all over the world. So thank you for sharing this inspiring Panel, and now uh, I would like to hand over to the journalist uh, Emiliano Boss. Uh, he's a journalist at the Swiss um, Broadcasting Corporation RSI in conversation with a young change maker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Now, from the big picture of uh, the geopolitical issues we have been uh, interested in listening to from the post-Kabul era, we go to more individual stories. We, we zoom in on some of the guests of the uh, young change makers who has been, who have been here in, in the last days in Lugano. Uh, we have an opportunity now with Zakaria Aljmali. Thank you so much. We ha will have another conversation a little bit uh, later during our program. So. First of all, can you tell us something about yourself? A brief, short biography, but we go into your story. Grazie mille, Emiliano. Sono onorato di, uh, di essere qui. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Zakaria Alshmali. I'm 27. I was born in Syria, but I'm becoming a European citizen hopefully very soon. I work and study at the European University Institute, School of Transnational Governance and as well as at the European Parliament Secretariat of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. My research is wide from digitalization to migration to European law to geopolitics, so it's more or less focused on the European core 
of the foreign relations and how it relates to the rest of the world. So that's already a lot. It was, it's short, but, but, but very interesting and full of... Um, your, your life has changed. We heard the uh, rector, Professor Boazeretz, talking about new narratives. And I, I was thinking about you because actually you came here from Syria during a very tough, I guess, time of your life and you transformed. So you are already telling us something else. How was this uh, transformation, if I, if I dare call it? I mean, of course, every process of integration is a process of transformation. The integration process of the refugees who arrive in Europe should have a new narrative and a new discourse. It should not be the responsibility of one nation state. This is the problem with the Dublin Agreement. This is why it didn't work. The way that I was integrated in Europe was through European integration. I was educated in Germany. Uh, I was also educated in England. I am now studying in Italy. I've worked in Belgium and this redistribution of burden because you know on one hand it is too much for one country to do and it's really important for us as Europeans to realize that we need the solidarity both in what is strong and what is hard but also you know when facing new challenges but also in fostering new talent and fostering European talents. And actually, you bring together the two sides of the Mediterranean. You're coming from the southern side of, of our Mare Nostrum, mm -hmm. and, and you've been around, well, you're more European than many Europeans because you've been experiencing different and living in different countries. And we heard um, earlier the Foreign Minister of Oman, al Busaidi mentioning that this redistribution of the burden when talking about crisis, he mentioned the Syrian crisis, but he was also talking about what's happening in Afghanistan. How your experience could be, um, let's say, a, a good example, a model of integration, because this is an issue we are facing today. Um, hopefully not, but it's quite likely that soon we will have some new, I don't like to call about wave of refugees. They are human beings, families, kids, girls, young ladies, uh, old people coming to Europe seeking for a better life. What could be a good approach? I think the most important approach that Europe needs to be careful about not politicizing is the separation between migration and asylum. Asylum is a right. Migration is not. Asylum is the difference between life and death. The problem that I saw from my very short stay in Europe was that on one side of the political spectrum, they, you know, they don't want any form of migration or asylum. And on the other side, they want it all or nothing. What I would say is, all that people need to receive is due process. Those who are in danger deserve protection. And we are now here in Switzerland, where the Geneva Convention uh, was written. So the, the idea of separating these two, depoliticizing life, as I would say it, because it is the most essential thing from the European experiment. Europe had a lot of refugees before, and Europe knows how hard it is to have these refugees to be maltreated, to be refused access to what you thought were your allies. So I would say Europe needs to learn from its own experience to reincarnate the never again that we promised in 1945. A couple of more points, if I can ask you on more personal base. Uh, you mentioned how tough or difficult might be for those coming, escaping from Afghanistan, and we always have to keep in mind that if you are forced to leave your country, means there's no other solution there where you stay, where you have your roots. Can I ask you personally how, how difficult it was for you, if you want to share some thoughts about your personal um, a journey, actually, to, to, from a, a war situation to, uh, I guess, a kind of a normal or a better life? I mean, my, my case or my story is by no way special. Every single refugee has his own story. But there is always a common denominator. There is always a factor of things that we think are normal. Walking through a minefield, going through the sea, risking your life and everything you own, carrying your entire belongings and then going to start somewhere new. These are things that we've taken for granted and we try to forget. Because there is no actual process to seek asylum. I'm, I'm very sorry, I have to be honest. 
The UNHCR's process takes forever. You know, the EU cannot agree on whether we should redistribute and how, what do we do with the Dublin Agreement. And it eventually turns, you know, to one nation state's decision. And this is not Europe. This shows, one, European lack of leadership. Second, European lack of cohesion. Third, European lack of solidarity. And with all of these, it kind of reflects on the politics inside if we can't agree on what is our fundamental value as Europeans to s protect life and save it, how can we agree on anything else? How can we agree on taxation? How can we agree on anything? So I think it's more or less something that just needs to be reframed. I don't think a single European would look at me and say, I'd much rather let someone die on my doorstep than open the door for them. I would look at them in the eye and say, you're not European. That's, you know, that's what I would say to that. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Just last point, you, um, along with other over 30 uh, colleagues as a, a young change makers, uh, you are supposed to, to change or to have a new perspective to bring new energies. Uh, where would you, let's say, uh, what, what are you hoping to be able to, you know, to change in a way, uh, ideally, if you could, or what are you working on to change? Uh, uh, something that, that you would like to, to see in a better shape? What I would hope for and what I'm working for now is to try to change the dialogue to better it, to move it from a vicious cycle into a virtuous one. So both in Europe and in the Middle East, because both regions are interconnected, as we heard before from Professor Kepel, as we heard from all of our honorable guests. So because the regions are interdependent, we need to kind of work on both sides from here. From the European side, we, we need to understand that politics in the Middle East will influence you, like now with the fall of Afghanistan. It really impacts your life, so you need to kind of be more interested, you need to know what are the consequences, and so on. But also from the Middle Eastern side. From the Middle Eastern side, we need to be able to have a difficult conversation in a safe environment. We need to be able not to fear to speak, we need to be able to engage, we need to have what we have here in the MIM Summer Summit, to have people from all over the MIM region to sit together to know that they're able to talk and to just share these ideas and find these new narratives that we can work from both sides to hopefully find a better future for both of our regions. Grazie, shukran. Uh, Zach, uh, mm. I, I quote, um, Swiss Prime Minister uh, Ignacio Cassis just mentioned, if the MEM region thrives, so Europe. Exactly what we just heard from you. Mm. So I really appreciate this first conversation. We will have another one a little bit uh, later. Now uh, I give the floor back to Diana for the next panel of the MEM Summer Summit. After this great conversation with Zakaria from Syria, we're very happy to introduce another central topic uh, in the region of the MEM. The religious sphere in the MEM region will be a very important panel, the second panel, so I'm very happy to um, also welcome the audience online. As you know, this year we have a hybrid um, format of the forum, so Ahla Sahla, everybody connected by Skype or online. Very happy to have you here. And this panel will be in French. So I will switch to French, but uh, il faut pas avoir peur. Uh, il y a une traduction uh, simultanée. So there will be a translation and everybody will understand each other. That's the aim of having these dialogues here at the uh, MEM Summer Summit. So I'm very honored to um, introduce the first uh, panelist. It's Professor Wasim Salman, uh, a Syrian-Italian professor of contemporary Arabic-Islamic thought at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, PISAI. Ahla wa sahla, ya ustaz. The second um, um, panelist is uh, Naila Tabara, the president of Adyan Foundation, a foundation based in Lebanon um, that is really doing an amazing work for diversity, solidarity, and human dignity. So important, not only these days, but especially these days, thinking also about Lebanon. Um, the third panelist, 
and young change maker. We're very happy that he made it all the way from Beirut uh, here, uh, Hadi Damien, uh, who's representing the young change makers, the 30 young change makers who made it to uh, Lugano and who have had the chance to have a dialogue during this um, seminar. For um, the introduction to the third uh, panelist, I hand over to the chairman of, uh, of, this, um, of this panel, uh, Luca Steinmann, journalist of the Fondazione Federica Spitzer, Faculty of Theology. Donc, c'est un honneur d'avoir uh, introduit les, um, les professeurs, donc uh, uh, Wassim uh, Salman, uh, Naila Tabara, Uh, le troisième hôte qui va être introduit par uh, Lucas Steinmann uh, dans un instant. Donc, bienvenue and have a good panel. Merci. And I would like to start introducing our first distinguished panelist that is connecting uh, online from here, uh, Mario Giro, who uh, has been the um, uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy, and he's representing today the Sant'Egidio uh, community, which is very active in the religious dialogue uh, field. So uh, very, uh, very welcome here. And uh, I would start now to give uh, the floor to our distinguished panelists by uh, talking about the topic that we are discussing today. This means the, uh, the, um, the conversations between religions, the dialogue between religions, the meeting between religions. What does it concretely mean uh, is the question that I'm going to ask to our panelists and uh, it, that's a question that we're going to discuss all together. We all remember that Pope Francis addressed a very strong message during his last uh, trip to Iraq in uh, March of this year where he spoke about the uh, dialogue, the meeting between religion as an important tool to, uh, to overgo, to overcome the conflicts in the area. But what does it concretely mean uh, to work on this uh, subject and uh, to um, enable relig religions and communities to speak one with the other? And uh, that's the first question I'm going to ask to uh, Professor uh, Salman, whom I'm asking to uh, answer in French. And I apologize because I'm the only uh, speaker today not speaking French, but in English. Um, Professor Salman, you're originally from Syria. Uh, I've been to Syria recently, around uh, one month ago. And uh, the situation there uh, can be considered as very hard since we are witnessing a very uh, large evacuation uh, of the young people that are leaving the country, not because of religious problems, basically, but mostly because of the very tense and very hard economic situation on the ground. So my question for you, or my input for you, is uh, do we have to fear that uh, a, a, a such a deep economic crisis that is involving Syria, but Lebanon, and many, and many other countries as well, well, could lead again to religious tensions in the area. Please, the virtual floor is yours. Merci de cette question et de l'invitation à ce panel sur le dialogue interreligieux, sur la nécessité de la religion. Et je voudrais commencer mon propos sur le dialogue et sa nécessité par évoquant, en évoquant le titre de l'ouvrage de Gilles Kepel, « Sortir du caveau ». C'est un titre très parlant qui nous met dans le contexte syrien et met en exergue les difficultés concrètes pour mettre fin au conflit. En effet, l'analyse du cas syrien permettra de faire apparaître les conditions qui ont contrarié le changement démocratique. La révolution syrienne de mars 2011 tire ses origines de la mobilisation politique contre le régime. Mais ce mouvement va dégénérer en guerre la plus cruelle de l'histoire moderne du Proche-Orient. Se méfiant des institutions politiques, la population syrienne a opté pour les institutions primitives, telles que la famille, la tribu et la religion. Donc, au lieu de revendiquer la liberté d'opinion et les droits inaliénables des citoyens, la protestation euh, s'est transformée en conflit violent entre les groupes ethniques et religieux. Les islamistes ont diffusé leurs idées extrémistes à travers les réseaux sociaux, divisant de plus en plus la population. Donc les groupes terroristes armés ont imposé leur rythme à la société syrienne, intégrant des chômeurs. Donc la crise économique avait des conséquences donc, sur la, la crise. Ils ont intégré des chômeurs contre leurs concitoyens. 
En 2012 déjà, la Syrie est plongée dans le chaos. La population est divisée d'une manière claire et nette entre les défenseurs du régime en place, à savoir les alawites, les chiites, les druzes, les chrétiens, et une partie des sudites modérés qui ne voulaient pas Daesh et ne voulaient pas le terrorisme. D'autre part, nous avons l'opposition syrienne qui ne représente pas tous les Syriens malheureusement parce qu'elle a une nature plutôt islamique et islamiste. Et donc, nous avons les frères musulmans, les djihadistes, indigènes, étrangers, etc. Donc, le régime a exploité aussi cette division et elle l'a exacerbée en libérant des djihadistes détenus dans les prisons, par exemple. Et dès lors, la division n'est pas seulement politique, mais aussi religieuse. Donc l'appartenance à un groupe religieux implique ipso facto un choix politique. Les djihadistes euh, s'engageaient contre les infidèles, alors que les sympathisants d'Assad voulaient à tout prix protéger les propres intérêts et le minimum de liberté que garantit un régime corrompu. Le dialogue interreligieux est une nécessité dans ce cas-là, est un pas indispensable en vue de la reconstruction de la Syrie exige un effort énorme de la part des Syriens, aussi des Européens, en collaboration avec la Russie, puisque la stratégie américaine ne semble pas claire, ne propose pas une alternative convaincante au chaos actuel. Nous avons l'exemple de l'Afghanistan et nous avons des réfugiés et comme conséquence du chaos toujours laissé après les invasions américaines malheureusement. Le dialogue interreligieux ne concerne pas seulement les, le rapport entre les religions, mais doit être in, entre, entrepris à l'intérieur de la même religion, Donc, notamment entre les musulmans qui constituent la majorité de la Syrie. On connaît bien que le conflit entre sunnites et chiites remonte au premier siècle. Le rapport entre les alawites et les sunnites est très tendu et est un rapport de violence depuis des siècles est devenu pur pendant les 50 dernières années. L'alliance du régime avec, syrien avec l'Iran et le Hezbollah a consacré la dimension religieux, euh, du, religieuse du conflit géopolitique entre l'Iran et l'Arabie saoudite. Cette alliance chiite alawite a marginalisé les autres groupes religieux de la Syrie, comme les chrétiens et comme les druzes. Les églises sont divisées à leur tour entre syriaques, maronites, orthodoxes, grecs catholiques, grecs orthodoxes, chaldéens, latins, etc. Ils n'ont pas de projet en commun, n'ont plus de vision pour l'avenir des chrétiens dans la région. C'est la survie, l'abandon de la terre, la terre des apôtres, des saints, malheureusement, c'est dur. Et personne n'a pris au sérieux un projet très important qui a été proposé par un missionnaire français, le père Jean Corbon, « L'Église des Arabes ». Cet ouvrage vraiment propose un projet très important pour unir tous les chrétiens dans la région. Ils ont des, des églises, des chrétiens, donc, et favorisent les intérêts du clergé, qui est soumis à son tour au régime, non pas l'intérêt des chrétiens, et affaiblissent les églises. La division de la population syrienne a donc des raisons historiques. Le rapport entre les différents groupes religieux reste marqué par la méfiance. Les membres des différentes traditions religieuses ne, ne se connaissent pas bien du point de vue religieux, Personne en Syrie ne connaît bien la doctrine, par exemple, à la 8, aux Druzes. Ces religions gardent un aspect mystérieux et ambigu qui fait un obstacle à un dialogue sincère et fraternel au-delà des questions euh, politiques. On s'interroge aussi pourquoi les chrétiens ont choisi le régime, par exemple. C'est bizarre. Pourquoi ils n'ont pas choisi la démocratie, la laïcité, la liberté, qui sont des valeurs chrétiennes et évangéliques avant tout à mon sens, l'attitude de chaque groupe puise ses motifs dans une longue histoire de tension et d'expériences positives et négatives. Un autre obstacle, je peux en parler, c'est le fondamentalisme islamique en croissance qui se réclame d'un âge d'or de la religion opposé à la décadence, à l'ignorance du présent. Malgré l'animosité du régime alaouite envers les frères musulmans, il a, fallu, il a fait un double jeu durant la guerre, ce qui a augmenté certainement la tension. Il s'est allié d'une part avec les minorités religieuses en présentant l'islam sunnite comme la seule menace qui veut attaquer la Syrie. D'autre part, il soutient les, depuis les années 80 les institutions et le discours islamiste le plus arriéré. Il construit des mosquées pour les salafistes, il fonde des écoles coraniques fondamentalistes il se sert de cette forme primitive de, de religion pour légitimer son pouvoir et alimenter la haine entre les groupes religieux. 
Donc, un religieux exige une réforme à l'intérieur de chaque religion. Il faut repenser les textes sacrés, les visions théologiques qui incitent à la violence. La réforme, la réforme du discours religieux conduit à la séparation entre religion et politique. Les églises elles-mêmes ne sont pas libres du pouvoir politique. Le clergé est au service de la dictature. Le changement du discours religieux implique une ouverture à un monde laïque, à la laïcité inclusive, qui garantit à tous les citoyens les mêmes droits et les mêmes devoirs sans nuire à leur engagement religieux. Enfin, je peux conclure mon propos, je dis une, une nouvelle interprétation de la religion détachée de toute perspective politique et qui fournit une approche inclusive aux citoyens amène à la transformation de la Syrie et à la sortie du chaos et à l'unité des Syriens en dépit des différences religieuses. Ainsi, les Syriens cessent de se considérer des ennemis, se mettent ensemble au service de la patrie en vue d'une nation moderne et démocratique. C'est la voie, à mon sens, qu'il qu faudrait entreprendre si l'on veut construire un avenir meilleur et permettre avant tout aux réfugiés de rentrer chez eux et de vivre en paix avec leurs concitoyens. Et merci. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for being with us and for keeping being with us in this conversation. Uh, I would like to give the floor to our uh, guest here, uh, which is the only one uh, not virtually on the floor, because we are speaking about how a um, new generation can coexist together, how different groups can coexist together. You are a young professor. You live with youngsters, with young people of your country, Lebanon. And when I was there one month ago, I was speaking with many young people, and no one told me that religious dialogue is a problem there or in any other parts of the region, but most of them were talking about the economic dimension. What's the future for Lebanon and for the youth of Lebanon in, in this term? Luca, il, est, il nous est arrivé depuis la période de, de l'Andalousie des récits qui racontent les interactions que les Juifs, les Chrétiens et les Musulmans avaient entre eux. Pendant longtemps, le débat interreligieux a été au sujet de toutes les conversations. On a cherché à comprendre les, les dogmes, on a cherché à comprendre les principes, on a cherché à créer une cohésion basée sur ce sacré religieux. Ces conversations persistent jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Et donc, euh, alors que le dialogue interreligieux est important, dialoguer, c'est toujours utile, ça permet de désamorcer beaucoup de situations, on est toujours dans une, dans une situation où on parle et on a envie de voir plus d'impact. Dans le cas du Moyen-Orient, c'est une zone qui est basée sur des... C'est une... C'est un territoire qui est basé quand même sur la logique des minorités, des minorités religieuses. Et du coup, on a fondé toutes les politiques publiques, tout le système public sur ces, euh, sur ces identités. Ce qui veut dire, d'une façon ou d'une autre, on est quand même à un niveau tribal. On est loin d'un état de droit, on est loin de, des institutions qui sont pour tout le monde, que ces personnes soient euh, pratiques euh, une religion ou qu'elles soient non pratiquantes. Finalement, quand on travaille pour une cohésion sociale, c'est le but de tout territoire dans lequel nous vivons, de toute vie digne euh, que nous souhaitons mener, il est important de, 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 ne, de ne pas isoler des gens et de, com de comprendre que finalement, c'est une conversation avec tout le monde qu'il faudrait avoir. Les crises économiques sont particulières parce qu'elles concernent tout le monde. Tout le monde en paie les frais. Dans le cas du Liban, par exemple, euh, chaque domicile a au moins deux lignes électriques. Une ligne électrique qui est celle de l'État. Dans Beyrouth, donc, la capitale est alimentée pour trois heures par jour. Ensuite, la deuxième ligne, qui est celle du générateur du quartier, le générateur privé, qui est censé assurer le reste, à savoir les 21 heures. Aujourd'hui, avec la pénurie du fioul, euh, nous n'avons même pas d'électricité du générateur pour 10 heures. Nous restons 11 heures dans une obscurité, si c'est la nuit, ou bien sans courant. Donc, du coup, on n'a même pas accès à la connexion Internet, les, les, les téléphones, les... Les, les, les ordinateurs portables, etc., ont une durée de, de vie. Donc, il y a des entraves exceptionnelles. Le fuel qui n'existe pas veut dire que les gens se mettent en ligne pendant des heures et des heures dans l'espoir d'avoir un peu de, de fuel dans, dans, dans la voiture, un peu d'essence. Et une fois arrivés 
euh, son tour arrivé, le, le mec du, de la station, de la pompe, pourrait facilement nous dire « Excusez-nous, on n'en a plus ». Et ça, c'est des choses basiques. Euh, les médicaments sont de plus en plus rares dans les pharmacies. Et la situation n'est pas une situation exclusive au Liban. C'est une réalité que l'on voit dans tous les pays. Euh, quand, ils souffrent de, quand ils sont fouettés par une crise économique. Dans les pays de la région, les origines sont souvent relatives à cette performance de euh, la, la politique identitaire. C'est un danger. Ce genre de politique ne peut que mener à plus d'isolation, de, 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 plus d'intégrisme, plus d'extrémisme. Pour le moment, on dit que c'est au Moyen-Orient. Ce forum nous montre que le Moyen-Orient n'est pas isolé de la Méditerranée. Qui dit Méditerranée dit Europe. Qui dit Europe dit le reste du monde. Donc, il est important de comprendre que ce qui se passe au Moyen-Orient n'est pas particulier pour le Moyen-Orient, ne restera pas au Moyen-Orient. Et il est représentatif de ce qui se passe à l'échelle globale. Ben, thank you very much for being here as well to enable also this dialogue between the two shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, Lebanon is actually uh, a perfect, um, gives a perfect perspective on all the region of all the Middle East. And here I would like to give the floor to Naila Tabara, who's heading a very important organization, a very important foundation based in Lebanon, but can, that can have from there a very large overview on what's happening in all the country and in all the, um, in all the region. Uh, that's why Madame um, Tabara I would like to give you the floor and to uh, explain to us like your perspective on the Middle Eastern Mediterranean region and how could we concretely implement a dialogue, a meeting between the different ethnic groups, the different ethnic and religious uh, majorities and minorities that form the Middle Eastern societies. Merci, Luca. Euh, je vais continuer euh, là où euh, Hadi Damien et, et Wassim Salman se sont arrêtés euh, pour dire que c'est très très important donc de prendre en considération euh, la religion pour comprendre la réalité sociopolitique autour de nous. Il est très important de toujours garder en vue la question de la diversité parce que elle est elle est fondamentale. Et c'est quelque chose que nous devons sauvegarder dans la région. Euh, mais je dois rappeler que nos problèmes sont avant tout des problèmes euh, politico-économiques. Donc, ce dont nous souffrons dans la région, c'est euh, premièrement de la corruption, là où il n'y a pas la guerre en plus. Donc, de la corruption et du despotisme, que les despotes soient éclairés ou pas. Euh, nous avons une mainmise politique, nous avons des droits de l'homme qui sont bafoués euh, et bien sûr donc la corruption. Euh, selon une étude, 91% euh, des, des, des jeunes arabes de toute la région disent que le plus grand problème, c'est le problème de la corruption. Face à ces problèmes, nous avons deux réactions et nous pouvons remarquer une polarisation en fait, ou deux pôles qui augmentent. Durant les dernières années, nous avons vu d'une part une, euh, une augmentation de jeunes qui disent « nous ne sommes pas religieux » ou bien « nous sommes euh, bon, spirituels, religieux, mais à notre manière, mais pour nous, il faut séparer le religieux du politique ». Nous avons vu de très belles positions en Irak et au Liban. Euh, avec euh, donc la révolution au Liban en 2019, en Irak aussi. Euh, euh, une des pancartes était très belle. En Irak, je me rappelle un jeune qui disait le, « euh, euh, le, 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 le Premier ministre, euh, son rôle, c'est de mener le pays vers euh, donc, euh, euh, la stabilité et la transparence et non pas de nous mener au ciel, au paradis. » Donc la religion n'a rien à voir là-dedans. Euh, au Liban aussi, nous avons euh, euh, beaucoup cette position, mais nous pouvons la retrouver de plus en plus dans les pays euh, arabes. Euh, aussi, les dernières statistiques montrent que autour d'une de plus de 20% de jeunes dans les pays arabes sont non religieux. Et encore un plus grand nombre est séculier. Donc, même s'ils sont religieux, ils veulent séparer la religion de euh, la politique. Donc ici, nous avons une position euh, rationnelle, lucide, qui veut vraiment séparer la religion de la politique. Et, euh, mais face à elle, nous avons une autre position qui est plutôt euh, émotionnelle, 
c'est euh, la position identitaire qui augmente aussi. Donc, je ne parle pas seulement de ceux qui, sont, euh, 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 qui font partie de partis euh, politiques islamistes, mais de toutes les personnes qui ont des réactions islamistes. Aujourd'hui, on l'a vu avec, euh, avec euh, le Taliban, les réactions euh, font peur. Ce ne sont pas seulement des réactions de la part de sunnites, nous avons eu des réactions de la part de Shahid pro Hezbollah qui sont pro-talibans, qui sont heureux, euh, qui ont vu cela comme euh, un gain. Euh, nous avons euh, aussi des réactions, euh, même le Mufti Doman, qui a, dit, qui, est, qui, a, qui a vu en cela aussi un gain pour l'islam euh, et, euh, et donc qui célébrait les talibans. Donc cela fait peur. Et bien sûr, nous avons beaucoup de personnes, de jeunes identitaires qui euh, sont dans cette position. Donc nous avons ce, ce, cette polarisation entre d'une part des gens qui, qui veulent complètement séparer euh, l'État euh, et bien sûr de la religion. Et bien sûr, ces personnes-là croient à la diversité, croient à l'importance de sauvegarder la diversité. Et surtout dans des pays comme le Liban, l'Irak, euh, euh, l'Égypte, euh, où vous avez euh, euh, cette diversité. Et euh, euh, bien sûr aussi beaucoup de Syriens qui pensent aussi pour sauvegarder la diversité syrienne pour la Syrie de demain. <rire> ah, ah, euh, et, euh, mais nous avons d'autre part donc un problème un problème euh, identitaire euh, religieux qui continue à augmenter et qui fait peur. Et, et celui-là, il est exclusif envers l'autre. Cela au niveau des gens, mais au niveau des politiques aussi, nous avons les axes, vous savez, vous, bien sûr, nous avons euh, l'axe Hezbollah euh, avec Zaidit euh, et, 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 et Alawit, euh, bien sûr, et tous leurs alliés. D'une part aussi qui ont la main mise. D'autre part, nous avons un axe qui est plutôt représenté par euh, l'Arabie Saoudite, l'Égypte, où nous avons des, euh, je dirais bien, donc des leaders euh, politiques qui eux s'immiscent dans le religieux, qui veulent euh, euh, un islam euh, éclairé et modéré, mais euh, qui viennent d'en haut et qui viennent d'eux et pas des leaders religieux. Et donc, ça là va faire des problèmes, surtout qu'eux-mêmes violent les droits de l'homme. Alors que nos problèmes basiques, c'est vraiment nos droits. Et nous avons aussi euh, une autre position qui, est, qui a instrumentalisé le religieux, surtout dans les accords d'Abraham. Donc, les Émirats arabes qui utilisent, qui ont fait toute une propagande de rapprochement islamo-juif euh, pour et, et, et chrétiens euh, dans la foulée, euh, pour euh, donc ces accords donc politico-économiques qui écœurent la plupart des, euh, des, 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 des jeunes et finalement qui vont pousser aussi un nombre de jeunes vers l'islamisme à cause de cela. Donc, Face à tout cela, quelle est la position, quelle est notre position Vous avez mentionné tout à l'heure, Luca, le discours du pape en Irak. Nous, à Adyan, dans la fondation Adyan, c'est sur quoi nous travaillons. Nous travaillons sur une citoyenneté inclusive de la diversité où des personnes de différentes euh, religions et de différents backgrounds culturels et ethniques œuvrent ensemble pour les droits, œuvrent ensemble pour la transparence, œuvrent ensemble pour les institutions de nos pays, œuvrent ensemble pour la justice, la justice restaurative. Quand on parle de l'Irak, il y a encore tous les yézidis qui sont encore euh, plus de 3000 euh, femmes et enfants qui sont encore disparus, qu'il faut euh, ramener. Il y a encore tous les gens qui sont déplacés. Donc, il y a la justice rest restaurative aussi. Toutes ces questions de bien commun euh, euh, œuvrer ensemble donc de backgrounds différents pour ce bien commun. C'est sur quoi nous travaillons euh, euh, à la Fondation Adiane, sur différents niveaux, au niveau de politique, donc euh, de, de, de dialogue politique, de plaidoyer, euh, au niveau de, bien sûr de l'éducation, pour éduquer à cette, à cette diversité, 
mais aussi donc à la citoyenneté active et à, au rôle de chacun de nous en tant que citoyens et citoyennes. Nous intégrons ceci aussi dans le discours religieux, donc nous essayons d'intégrer dans le discours et l'enseignement religieux les valeurs de la vie publique, donc la citoyenneté, l'acceptation de la diversité, la justice, toutes ces valeurs-là, à intégrer donc dans le discours euh, et l'enseignement religieux, que ce soit l'enseignement dans les écoles ou l'enseignement euh, euh, donc chrétien et musulman ou l'enseignement des imams euh, et cela non seulement au Liban mais pour euh, pour tous les tous les pays arabophones et euh, nous travaillons aussi euh, euh, donc à travers cela sur un concept que nous appelons la responsabilité sociale des religions donc œuvrer à ce que les religions n'aient pas un apport qui soit seulement pour leur propre groupe mais euh, que ces valeurs euh, que, que prônent les religions, euh, elles y travaillent pour toute la société, mais d'une manière non identitaire. Donc c'est un peu à travers cela que nous travaillons et surtout nous travaillons euh, pour la liberté de religion et de conviction, euh, donc pour la liberté de chacun de croire et de penser comme il ou elle veut. Donc, toutes ces questions-là sont très, très importantes, mais je rappelle qu'à la base, il y a nos droits, il y a la situation donc, euh, euh, sécuritaire, économique, euh, dans laquelle nous, nous sommes, euh, et, et, euh, et peut-être avec le temps, un peu, nous essayons de travailler ensemble, mais tout ce que nous faisons devient de plus en plus un luxe quand on n'a pas les bases. Je m'arrête ici. Merci. Thank you very much for your interesting intervention. And I would give the virtual floor now to uh, Mario Giro, because um, as it was mentioned now, and especially as it was mentioned last year by French President Emmanuel Macron when he uh, held his keynote speech here at the MAM uh, 2021, he spoke about the need of having an interreligious dialogue, a meeting between religions, and a coexistence between religions as a goal of us, of a goal of the West, of a, as a shared goal. Uh, Mr. Giro, you have a large and long experience in interreligious dialogue, also on a diplomatic level, and you're active in a community, Sant'Egidio community, who, who plays a key role in Italy uh, for this. Uh, would you like to comment this? Uh, how could we, as Western community, as Switzerland, as Italy, play a role in supporting the dialogue, the meeting, the conversation between religion in the MENA region? Merci beaucoup, vous m'entendez, j'espère. Euh, je vais enchaîner sur ce que euh, a été dit par Naila euh, juste avant moi. Je pense que, avant tout, la question euh, du dialogue et de la paix dans, en, dans, la, même, dans la région même euh, est une question politique, n'est pas une, une question théologique. Donc il faut distinguer exactement entre le dialogue des théologiens, ça c'est une question qui concerne les églises et les dénominations, euh, la Oumma islamique, euh, etc., les différentes dénominations, et puis le dialogue de la vie. C'est vrai, le problème majeur qui est ressenti par les gens, et par les jeunes en particulier, c'est la corruption, l'inégalité, l'inégalité et le manque de liberté. Finalement, c'est la démocratie qui est recherchée, même si la démocratie est difficile, elle le désordre. Les, les faits tunisiens sont très importants pour comprendre qu'est-ce qui se passe. Et aussi, les manipulations de ce discours sont nombreuses. Mais Naïla l'a déjà dit très bien, et je ne vais pas me, euh, me répéter ce qu'elle a déjà très bien dit. Euh, en ce sens, c'est très vrai que dans les pays arabes, il y a des formes de sécularisation. Il y a des gens qui ne sont plus religieux, bien sûr. La manipulation multiple de la religion, par exemple en islam, mais même c'est la même chose pour le christianisme, pour les juifs et pour les autres religions aussi. Hein. Il ne faut pas oublier qu'il y a d'autres grandes religions. Euh, par exemple, en Asie, on a l'impact de la rencontre avec l'hindouisme et le bouddhisme. Ce n'est pas facile. Il y a un extrémisme hindou très fort, on le remarque. Il y a un extrémisme même bouddhiste. Je ferme la parenthèse. Il y a même ceux qui disent que cette sécularisation a, euh, il y a une forme, il y a même ceux qui soutiennent qu'il y a une forme de sécularisation dans le monde arabe, dans le monde arabo-musulman, qui, euh, qui est le djihadisme. 
qui interprète le djihadisme comme une forme de sécurisation, c'est-à-dire la soumission de la religion à un discours politique. Mais pour ce qui me concerne, l'expérience de Sant'Egidio part de l'intuition du, du pape Jean-Paul II. Quelle est l'intuition du pape Jean-Paul II en 1986 Son intuition, c'est que euh, les religions vont avoir à nouveau un rôle important sur le terrain politique. Le premier qui comprend la logique de cette, euh, de cette euh, intuition du pape Jean-Paul II, et c'est justement Gilles Kepel avec son livre, je cite un autre livre, mais un vieux livre, « La revanche de Dieu ». Il y a une revanche de Dieu. On venait des années 80 où on disait « Dieu va-t-il mourir ?» C'était la fin. On pensait que c'était la fin des religions, qu'il n'y avait plus de place pour le christianisme, pour l'islam, pour le judaïsme. Tandis qu'en peu d'années, en réalité, dans l'islam, ça avait déjà commencé en 79 avec la révolution islamique en Iran et, et toute une série d'autres choses, mais euh, en peu d'années, on a vu la revanche de Dieu, effectivement. Alors, Jean-Paul II a cette intuition euh, et il lit le dialogue à la recherche de la paix. Les deux euh, sont exactement la même chose pour lui. Euh, son intuition, c'est la paix est à nous, à nous, c'est-à-dire aux religieux, aux religieux. Et il convoque à Assise les grandes religions du monde contre le, la vie des, euh, des cardinaux plus importants de la curie. Il convoque, et c'est un geste qui confirme son autorité et son intuition, c'est les religions qui doivent... On n'a pas confiance dans la politique, dans les politiques. Il faut reprendre la main sur la question de la paix. Il faut se rappeler que c'était juste au passage. Il voyait le, la fin du monde communiste, il l'entrevoyait, à, à laquelle il a contribué, et euh, il, en quelque sorte, il arrache la paix aux communistes. Parce que jusqu'à ce moment-là, c'était les communistes avec les mouvements, etc., internationaux, qui, surtout l'Union soviétique, qui se disaient euh, « la paix est un discours que nous continuons à faire ». Euh, nous, ce, euh, que nous, que nous continuons, nous, communistes, marxistes, euh, nous avons à cœur, tandis que les Américains et les Occidentaux sont des, des gens qui aiment la guerre. Alors le pape a cette intuition, il convoque les religions et ils font les deux choses ensemble. Le dialogue euh, interreligieux, mais ce n'est plus un dialogue théologique pour le pape Jean-Paul II. Et Saint-Égide, depuis 1986, a continué ce parcours chaque année en convoquant les grandes religions du monde. Alors là, c'est très intéressant, c'est un, un virage historique. La paix qui cherche ses artisans, qui a un chantier toujours ouvert, j'utilise les paroles du pape en 1986. Je rappelle que le pape, l'année précédente, était allé à Casa, avait rencontré des jeunes musulmans dans le stade, euh, et euh, dans la même année, euh, 86, où il convoque Assise, il était allé à la synagogue de Rome, premier pape qui rentre dans une synagogue. Donc, il lit ces deux choses. Et le, le changement, le changement c'est les transitions pacifiques que les religions doivent euh, impliquer, doivent euh, propulser. Alors, on, nous, on demandait quel est l'impact de tout ça. L'impact est politique. Déjà, il y a l'idée de Jean-Paul II des transitions pacifiques, comme au Chili, comme aux Philippines. Mais c'est toujours dans un monde, disons, chrétien. Euh, mais aussi, euh, en quelque sorte, l'impact se décèle dans le dialogue même de la vie qui prend du temps. Se connaître, se rencontrer et se confronter sur les grands thèmes, les, grands, les grandes religions du monde se confrontent sur les grands thèmes du moment, comme l'écologie, comme etc., pour les grands problèmes, le dialogue de la vie. Et euh, il y a aussi... Euh, j'ai vécu personnellement l'impact dans le travail commun des musulmans et des chrétiens pour la paix. J'ai l'exemple de l'Algérie, qui est un exemple qui n'a pas marché en 1995, mais qui a, été, qui a créé un mouvement, un, un mouvement réconciliateur, où les chrétiens et les musulmans ont travaillé ensemble, même si les chrétiens euh, en Algérie sont très peu nombreux, et c'est surtout les chrétiens, disons, d'Europe, mais j'ai l'exemple aussi de Hatché en Indonésie, de Mindanao dans les Philippines. saint égide a coopéré avec la Mohamedia euh, indonésienne en faisant la médiation pour Mindanao. Et ça, ça a marché. Donc, c'est tout un aspect, euh, disons, on est en pleine recherche. Hein. 
Euh, c'est vrai que presque plus de 30 ans sont passés de, de 1986, mais euh, la revanche de Dieu est toujours en cours. Euh, il y a les dévoiements de cette revanche de Dieu. Et surtout, c'est très intéressant de comprendre comment les musulmans et les chrétiens, par exemple, mais aussi les juifs, en se rapprochant et en travaillant ensemble pour quelque chose, c'est l'objectif qui compte, la paix dans un lieu, une situation de tension qu'il faut résoudre. saint égide normalement, fait son travail de base, c'est-à-dire travail avec les pauvres, en ne faisant pas de différence entre pauvres musulmans et pauvres chrétiens dans les pays d'Asie ou d'Afrique. Et ça, ça crée des réflexes sur le terrain. Et, euh, et une autre chose, c'est la dernière que je veux aborder, c'est que nous devons changer, nous avons changé notre perception même de la guerre. Déjà, euh, Naila euh, a expliqué très bien, mais Salman aussi, le professeur Salman nous a expliqué toutes les ambiguïtés dans la guerre de Syrie. La guerre est quelque chose d'ambigu, mais n'est pas un accident de l'histoire, inéluctable. N'est pas, n'est jamais une conséquence mécanique d'une situation, ou le fruit autonome de l'histoire, ou un passage, ou certaines conditions la provoque sans sans que personne ne puisse, ne puisse l'arrêter. Ça, c'est l'idée que beaucoup ont. La guerre du cacao, la guerre des diamants, la guerre de l'eau, la guerre du pétrole. Ce sont des conceptions automatiques, un peu mécanicistes de la guerre, comme si l'homme ne pouvait rien faire. Non, la guerre est toujours un choix, un choix politique. Et euh, un choix qui, naturellement, se nourrit, se nourrit des questions économiques, se nourrit de la corruption, se nourrit euh, de l'inégalité, se nourrit du mépris qui se fait culture et qui déforme l'âme des peuples, se nourrit de toute une série de choses. On peut le dire, même en termes religieux, une architecture spirituelle qui tombe malade. Mais la vérité, disons, euh, ce qui cache cette, euh, cette phrase, c'est qu'il y a euh, des aspects de choix humain qui provoque la guerre. Alors, comme il y a toujours un choix humain, et ce n'est pas une chose qui tombe du haut euh, ou de l'extérieur, inéluctable, ce choix peut être renversé, peut être changé. Et c'est ça. Là est le point. Là est le... Euh, disons, la tentative du dialogue de, euh, interreligieux pour la paix se fonde sur le fait de convertir le choix de guerre en choix politique. Passer du terrain militaire et violent au terrain politique. On n'est pas iréniste, on ne pense pas que les, euh, les différents entre peuples, nations, euh, euh, hommes, groupes, etc., puissent s'évanouir dans une espèce d'embrassement nous irénique. Non, ce n'est pas ça. Le, l'objectif est de passer du terrain militaire au terrain politique, de la, donc de la guerre à la négociation, et ça, c'est, si vous voulez, la base de la démocratie. C'est pour ça que la démocratie est toujours désordre, parce que c'est une transposition de la guerre dans un, un, un schéma de règles et de valeurs. Je m'arrête là. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Giro. And we have a few minutes left in which we can have a conversation, maybe ask him some question to our distinguished uh, guests, speakers. And I would like to start uh, with you, Hadi. Uh, Hadi, uh, did you, like... Do you want to ask something to our uh, panelists, or is there something you'd like to comment on what you hear so far? I mean, there are many subjects that we'd like to comment together, but pick up one. Bah, déjà, c'est un honneur d'être, en, d'être à l'écoute de tous ces commentaires, de tout ce qui a été dit. C'est beaucoup de food for thought, c'est beaucoup de, de réflexions qui suivent. Donc merci pour ce partage. On comprend que, les, euh, que la sphère religieuse et les, la bulle religieuse au Moyen-Orient est, a tellement de correspondances entre elles, aussi bien entre les juifs, les musulmans, les, les chrétiens, les autres religions, les, euh, les gens qui ne suivent pas une certaine religion. On comprend aussi que au commencement, la religion veut exister dans un certain endroit, puis elle veut s'afficher comme étant la religion du souverain. Mais qu'en est-il de la stabilité et c'est ça la question que j'aimerais euh, poser pour celle, pour celui qui souhaiterait y répondre. Euh, suite à vos interactions avec les gens, suite à vos recherches, suite à ces aperçus historiques, qu'est-ce qui se, quelle chose concrète pourrions-nous contempler pour avoir plus de stabilité dans une région, 
où les religions ont un rôle tellement important, tellement émotionnel pour les gens. The question is really tough, and especially it would be tough to answer it in one minute, 45 seconds, which is our time. But since our level is very high here, I would invite some of our uh, panelists to try to answer to this. Someone would like to? I'm ready. Yeah. Euh, donc c'est exactement sur quoi nous travaillons, euh, Hadi, dans Adiane. Le, le concept de citoyenneté inclusive de la diversité, pour nous, représente quoi Ce que nous appelons dans nos sociétés ici euh, la, euh, l'État civil, pour ne pas dire un État religieux, donc, l'État civil, nous l'expliquons en étant la citoyenneté inclusive de la diversité, dans le sens où nous devons œuvrer pour avoir des États où l'identité de l'État est, est une identité basée sur la diversité et non basée sur une seule religion qui, euh, qui, qui contrôle l'espace public. Donc, c'est un État de droit où nous avons des euh, droits culturels pour les différentes ethnies, pour les différentes cultures, et où nous avons les droits euh, euh, donc de liberté de religion et de conviction pour toutes les personnes à penser, à, euh, à, à pratiquer, ne pas pratiquer, changer de religion euh, comme ils veulent, interpréter la religion différemment comme ils veulent. Aujourd'hui, par exemple, nous avons dans beaucoup de nos pays ce qu'on appelle la loi du blasphème. Ça veut dire si quelqu'un dit quelque chose de négatif sur une religion, on peut le mettre en prison. Si quelqu'un dit quelque chose de différent sur une religion, euh, par exemple en Égypte, il y a des gens qui disent « Voilà, nous ne croyons pas beaucoup au hadith, nous croyons au Coran, qui s'appelle les coranistes, et ceux-là sont mis en prison, juste parce qu'ils ont une interprétation différente. » Et donc, et, et, et beaucoup de fois, la loi du blasphème, ce n'est pas seulement euh, pour les, les gens qui appartiennent à la majorité et expliquent différemment, mais beaucoup de fois sur les minorités, comme nous savons, par exemple, le Pakistan, Asia Bibi et beaucoup d'autres euh, exemples de pays euh, dans la région. Donc, euh, euh, donc les droits euh, de, de, de chacun de penser ce qu'il veut, de, de, de croire ce qu'il ou elle veut et euh, de revendiquer leur appartenance religieuse, culturelle, ethnique, ce qu'ils veulent, dans un espace qui maintient les droits de tout le monde. C'est ce, euh, sur cela que nous travaillons, avec en même temps euh, euh, un vrai contrat social et une vraie position de l'individu, du citoyen et de la citoyenne, comme eux acteurs de changement comme eux qui, euh, euh, à, à qui les responsables politiques doivent rendre compte. Mais c'est tellement utopique en vue de la dystopie dans laquelle nous vivons maintenant. Euh, euh, mais cependant, nous travaillons sur cela. Nous essayons autant que nous pouvons d'éduquer de, euh, de, de, à cela. Nous avons même un site web à Eden que nous appelons Taradoudia. Ça veut dire pluralisme, euh, dans lequel euh, nous mettons des articles, des petits films, et qui, euh, qui est suivi par 20 millions de personnes annuellement euh, dans, du, du, du monde arabe, euh, donc parlant arabe. Donc, nous essayons de semer des graines, peut-être qu'on ne va pas les voir durant notre, <rire> notre temps, mais nous espérons que ce sont des graines qui vont faire fructifier ce que euh, Hadi euh, demandait. Thank you very much for your precious intervention, and I would like to thank also all the other panelists that were here with us today. And uh, I think we're running out of time, so I will give the floor, the physical floor this time, to our moderator to go on to the next panel. And thank you very much for every, uh, to everyone for being here today. Shukran. Thank you, Luca. Thank you to all the panelists. Since we have the privilege of having uh, the young change maker here in Lugano, I would like to give the floor to them in order to um, pose a question to the panelists uh, who are connected via Skype. So we can really, you know, have this almost personal exchange. So please, a question from the young change makers of the audience. Fadalu. 
Euh, bonjour à tous et euh, merci pour votre, euh, vos interventions respectives. Euh, je voulais vous demander par rapport à un défi euh, générationnel éventuel, parce que euh, les pays du Moyen-Orient globalement sont, sont une population euh, très jeune. Et euh, vu qu'on a parlé de religion, en général, les chefs religieux sont euh, relativement âgés, sont dans une position euh, d'autorité par rapport à leur âge. Euh, quand eux-mêmes étaient adolescents, peut-être que le, la question était plutôt au niveau politique, au niveau du, du gauchisme. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous pensez serait le défi générationnel d'avenir de cette jeunesse Est-ce qu'il sera toujours religieux Est-ce qu'il aura changé non. Qui veut répondre à cette question Question très très pertinente. Donc merci. Oui, je peux répondre moi-même. Oui, je pense que c'est l'avenir de la de la région euh, dépend vraiment de cette décision. Euh, je suis pas sûr que les nouvelles générations seront tout à fait sans religion. Cette question a été abordée durant les années 80-90 après le, la chute du communisme que le monde sera sans religion. Mais le Proche-Orient n'est pas, pas comme ça. Je pense euh, le conflit entre les générations continue. Mais il faut former les nouvelles générations. C'est ça ma, mon idée. Il faut former les nouvelles générations et, 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 et demander à eux d'abandonner les formes de religion euh, fondamentaliste, les formes erronées de, de religion, d'appartenance religieuse. Donc il faut former la, la, le Proche-Orient, il faut mettre un programme euh, clair pour les no nouvelles générations. Sinon, on va tomber dans une situation comme celle de l'Afghanistan. En 20 ans, euh, il n'y avait pas un vrai changement dans, dans les attitudes religieuses, dans l'interprétation, la lecture de la religion elle-même. Donc je pense que c'est la question de former les générations selon une nouvelle euh, culture laïque. La laïcité est une nécessité pour transformer le Proche-Orient. Euh, je ne dis pas une laïcité exclusive, exclusiviste, qui euh, ne respecte pas l'appartenance religieuse. Euh, il y a beaucoup de formes de laïcité, mais c'est une exigence, je pense, pour euh, mettre les, les fondements d'un nouveau Proche-Orient. Euh, tu ne peux pas faire une démocratie dans un pays, dire que c'est un pays qui peut être démocratique, là où les, la majorité sunnite vote pour un sunnite, la majorité chiite vote pour un chiite, les chrétiens votent pour un chrétien. Ce n'est pas, pas ça la démocratie. La démocratie, c'est voter pour un programme électoral, pour la construction de la nation, ce n'est pas pour un membre de la même euh, tradition religieuse. Donc, euh, c'est vrai, ça, la, la préparation d'un Proche-Orient démocratique, c'est la formation des nouvelles générations, changer les programmes euh, scolaires, changer les programmes caté catéchétiques aussi dans les églises, dans les mosquées, etc. Et je pense qu'on peut faire quelque chose, euh, euh, pas à, à court terme, mais à long terme. Une vingtaine d'années, trentaine d'années de formation de travail continu peut changer quelque chose. Merci beaucoup, euh, Oustaz euh, Oussine Salman, pour ce euh, mot. Je pense que ça, 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 ça fait le tour euh, de ce panel très, très intéressant où on a justement euh, ce concept euh, d'une transition à une laïcité inclusive euh, et primordiale, donc toujours avec un, un discours euh, pour les jeunes, la formation, la centralité, euh, d'intégrer aussi euh, les valeurs euh, dans, euh, dans la religion, dans, dans l'instruction, euh, d'accepter la diversité euh, comme a dit aussi il, euh, il a dit donc euh, euh, souvent encore dans la région euh, tout est basé sur des identités euh, minoritaires euh, donc euh, vraiment poussé pour cette cohésion euh, vraiment pour tout le monde pour toute la société et euh, justement comme on a aussi entendu euh, euh, monsieur euh, Mario Giro avec euh, euh, ces, ces, ces inégalités qui, qui sont encore persistantes, donc les jeunes qui sont à la recherche de la démocratie et déjà une longue histoire aussi euh, du pape euh, qui voulait cette transition euh, pacifique euh, avec un impact euh, politique vraiment 
to make the change, pour faire la différence. Donc, merci beaucoup pour ce panel très, très intéressant. Thank you, Luca, for being the chair of this fascinating panel. And I thank you for participating. And after this fascinating panel, I'm very happy to hand over to our journalist from RSI, Emiliano Boss, who will be in a conversation with Pascal Osseur. He's the Vice Admiral and General Director of the Institut Fondation Méditerranée d'Études Stratégiques in France. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana. Here we are now with another conversation, or let's say an interview, one-to-one, -one with Admiral Pascal Osser. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I would start immediately from what we saw during the last months or the uh, difficult 2020. The COVID uh, brought a kind of uh, uh, economical collapse, but now we are seeing some positive signs, some improvement. Um, Admiral, do you think that the, uh, the crisis that have marked the, um, the MEM region, we are talking about this, uh, both side, all, all sides of the Mediterranean, will somehow benefit from, from this economical improvement? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this invitation and, uh, and this uh, opportunity to, to share with you some thoughts about the situation of the Mediterranean uh, Middle East region uh, which is one of uh, the most tense region in the world. And so it is uh, worthwhile to spend, uh, I guess, uh, I think some time to try to have a better understanding about what's happened here and to find out some way uh, to, to, to ease these tensions. So, uh, and, and one of the tools to ease uh, the tensions are the economy. And uh, this question uh, and the panel uh, uh, dedicated to the economic uh, issues uh, are very interesting because uh, they raise the question of the weight of the economy in the international affair today. And in my view, this weight is changing dramatically because of the strategic rupture uh, we are living. Uh, and this rupture, if uh, have two main strengths, and in short, one, history is back, and two, uh, the West is fragile. Uh, the f f first point, history is back. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, 30 years ago, during the, the 90s, the economy has been considered as a, the alpha and omega of human relations, including international relations. All the other aspects, culture, politics, religion, military power, and so on, all these aspects became secondary. And it seems that at, this, at the time that nothing could prevent the growth of the economic sphere. Uh, remember, the, the development of the GDP was supposed to lead to social development, to, to ease uh, tensions, to... to to, to ease uh, societal progress, democratization, and so on. It was uh, the Fukuyama, the end of history paradigm, which uh, underpinned, it. in fact, all the analysis uh, for, for 30 years, or nearly 40 years, uh, 30 years. And, and uh, the Mediterranean was a point of application of this. Uh, let's just recall the situation in the 90s. The, the, the convergence between uh, the two shores uh, uh, towards the European model was considered as inevitable. And this convergence underpinned all the agreement signed at those times. Uh, for the EU, the Barcelona Summit and the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership in 95. Remember as well the OSCE uh, Mediterranean Partnership for Cooperation in uh, 94. Uh, NATO, uh, NATO's Mediterranean uh, dialogue in '97, even the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Oslo Accords in '93. Uh, uh, well, all these agreements was supposed to lead, uh, because of the economy, uh, to the quasi-automatic pacification of the region, and this region was supposed to gradually integrate 
into, uh, I would say, uh, a form of a, a European melting pot. But clearly, it's not the case today. Uh, just one example, uh, in, uh, tw uh, 2010 was the target date for the establishment of the free trade area in this region, in, in the Med. Well, we are clearly very far from it. So one point, history is back. Second point, the second big trend which characterize the new world, not only here, but, uh, but here as well, is what I call the um, de-westernization of the world. This de-westernization was uh, already thought, uh, I would say, un unavoidable because of the rise of the China, but uh, it has been um, fostered by the, the catastrophic management of the unipolar period by the US and with Europe as follower. And so uh, I think that the West lost a lot of uh, its credibility and of, and of, uh, of its uh, attractiveness during, uh, during because of that. And uh, the other failures, uh, internal or external, uh, I would say military defeats uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Look at the, the fall of Kabul, uh, which is a very good illustration of it uh, yesterday, uh, a few days ago. Uh, but as well, uh, internal failures, inequalities, individualism, and so on. Uh, all, this, all this trend damaged uh, it, the prestige, I would say, of the West. So, Admiral, you mentioned new trends, history is back, something is changing and economy is not enough. But what about the impact of these new trends that you just mentioned in terms of um, security in the region we are talking about, specifically in the Mediterranean? Uh, in my view, the Mediterranean basin is subject to two uh, phenomena. The first one is the rising of uh, north-south tensions. Uh, we have disparities between north and south, and these disparities are growing in nearly all the domains, economy, development, demography, cultural, social, political systems. All the metrics, all the, all the, all the charts, all the maps show growing uh, disparities, which are, that's another point, increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, perceived by the population. And this uh, discrepancy generates a growing frustration and tensions within the countries and between the two shores of the Mediterranean. And uh, these frustrations are exploited by authoritarian powers, often, or ideology, uh, to create and uh, to, to reinforce a strong resentment, resentment uh, towards Europe. And that's the first point. So rising of tensions, structural tensions. And the second point, uh, the second big change in, in this region is uh, when you compare we compare with the situation as it was uh, 25 years ago, is the rise of the geopolitical competitors. Uh, this competition was uh, fueled by the retractation of the U.S., uh, which has been very sensitive uh, since Obama uh, uh, period, but Trump uh, and Biden area will be the same. Uh, so a retraction. Uh, retractation of the U.S., and uh, it gives uh, the space uh, for regional power to take advantage of this uh, 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 space left free uh, to emancipate and uh, to defend their interests more and more bluntly without constraint, and, and that's, that's clearly very uh, blatant in, in, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, the use of force is more and more disinhibited because the international rules are more and more considered as Western rules. And that's part of the de-Westernization I mentioned. So uh, very shortly, Russia uh, is coming back, is taking advantage of the withdrawal, U.S. withdrawal to regain its uh, lost influence in Middle East, in Syria, in the Red Sea, in North Africa. Turkey is clearly a newcomer Uh, it plays a kind of a jeu à trois, uh, you know, with the U.S., Russian, and to, to consolidate uh, its glaciers in Syria, in Iraq, in Azerbaijan, in northern Cyprus, but as well to extend uh, its uh, influence uh, in Syria again, in Iraq, in, Azer uh, in Libya, sorry, in, in, uh, in Somalia, in the Balkans. 
they are more and more present in the Balkans, and to strengthen uh, the level of pressure vis-à-vis uh, -vis Europe. Migration, gas, diaspora. So Turkey is clearly a new, very strong actor uh, in this, uh, in this uh, area, Uh, with an increasingly uh, strong military tool, which, which gives uh, another, uh, another uh, concern uh, on it. Uh, another point uh, about these actors, uh, it's about the actors who were previously in the Western sphere, I would say, uh, alongside the, the, the US, which are more and more uh, autonomous vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. And uh, you have Egypt in Libya, for example, you have the, the, the politics of Israel in the Red Sea in the, in, or in Morocco. You have Qatar in support of the Muslim Brotherhood networks in Turkey, in Libya, and uh, uh, you have the Emirates uh, in, uh, in opposition with, uh, with, uh, with Qatar policy uh, in, this, in this area as well. Uh, so uh, this, I would say, rebalancing of powers Uh, uh, favor the a kind of, uh, I would say, Middle Eastization of the Mediterranean. And, and that, that's a kind of a return to sender, I would say, of the uh, attempt to western, uh, to westernize uh, the, great, the greater Middle East, uh, as uh, Bush uh, said in the previous decade. So uh, another example of, the, of this trend is uh, Iran increasing involvement uh, to, to support uh, its presence in, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, or uh, alongside Hamas uh, in, in the Med. Last uh, big power which is, playing, which is playing in the Med is China, uh, more discreet because its security issues are more in the Gulf and Indian Ocean to... to to preserve and to protect the transit of its uh, energy flow uh, from the Gulf. And Djibouti base is very key in that uh, policy. But in the Med, uh, China plays uh, more um, uh, on, on the economic side. Uh, the Mediterranean is a commercial axis, which gives to China an access to the European market. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the main uh, point Uh, for them is to secure participation in big ports in the, the region with Piraeus, uh, which is a center of gravity of all this uh, framework, but uh, Haifa, uh, uh, Marseille uh, are, and other, uh, other uh, ports are very, very uh, uh, under scrutiny from, from, uh, from China. And in the south shore, in the southern shore, uh, it gives a foothold uh, on Africa Uh, through infrastructure and export partnership uh, or hydrocarbons uh, and it allows China to have a strategy on influence uh, in, in Africa which is key uh, to, to, to obtain raw materials for example uh, especially for raw materials so uh, last point with China because it's inter interesting to see that China needs It's an actor which needs to improve regional stabilization, which is not the case of all the other actors, as, as you can imagine. So you can see that nearly everybody is playing in this region, already, which is already under tension. That, made, that makes the, the Mediterranean, well, once again, the most volatile region in the world, alongside with the, the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral. Uh, I keep some of these thoughts and I, in a way, pass them to uh, my colleague Luca Fasani for um, the next panel, which will be centering and focusing on economy. I felt a bit of a pessimism in your vision, in your words. Maybe we can go back on that. Also, we will touch something about the role of uh, Europe. But I would um, stop our conversation for the moment here and I'm happy to give the floor To, to the next panel, which is uh, focusing exactly on these topics. Uh, Admiral, thank you so much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you. Well, 
let's have now a little bit of economics. That's uh, always there when we speak about uh, the big topics and the big problems. But first of all, I would like to thank uh, our uh, distinguished participants in this panel. We already met before uh, Monsieur Auxerre, and uh, he will be joined now by uh, Mr. Karim El Ainoui, is uh, executive president of the Policy Center for the New South in Rabat, and he's also the dean of the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences and executive vice president of the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University. He was, also, he was also active at the Central Bank of Morocco and the World Bank. Also in this panel, and uh, not for the first time in a MEM panel, so welcome back, is also Gian Piero Massolo. He is uh, president of Fincantieri and also president of the Italian Institute for International Policy ES Studies, ESP. He's a career diplomat. Uh, Ambassador Massolo was, among other tasks, uh, the coordinator of the Italian intelligence community and uh, the Italian Prime Minister personal representative for the G8 and the G20 summits. He's also a professor in the field of national security and foreign relation at different institutions. And uh, just when we speak about uh, national security, I would go with the first question to uh, Gian Piero Massolo. As, uh, we heard before from Mr. Rosser, okay, the economy is doing well, maybe even fine after the shock, but uh, the security situation is not improving. Uh, uh, so what, what does this mean for a, a region that is very close to Europe and uh, Europe should be a stabilizing factor. What, what should be the role of Europe in this security situation in the Mediterranean? Please, Mr. Massolo. Well, Fred, thank you very much for having invited me also this year to this uh, very important meeting and congratulations for your work and for your debates. Um, well, insecurity, um, actually, Admiral Osser is, is quite right. It's not improving, not improving at all. I would say quite the contrary. And the risk that we are running here is uh, sort of a, uh, for, for on one side, creating such something like an, uh, a black hole in which all the initiatives uh, sink uh, one to the other. And the second uh, risk is actually to, to live in a context of missed opportunities. Uh, we live in a uh, transition that is, um, we are witnessing sort of a global reshaping of the strategic situation. We are living, as Ian Bremer would say, in a T-zero world. And this, if we apply this to the Mediterranean, we see that we, uh, we witness a uh, continuous phase of retrenchment by the United States. The United States increasingly uh, seem to want to rely on um, I mean, of, of a balance of power in the region that would be autonomous, not uh, led by the United States. And uh, quite on the contrary, we, we still don't have a, uh, a security, a broader security framework in replacement of the, the old situation in which, actually, uh, to a certain extent, the United States represented sort of a reference power. Uh, this creates uh, two uh, kinds of phenomena. One phenomenon is that the balancing role should be assumed by European Union, but the European Union is as divided as ever. I would say it's a collection of national positions, much more than a uh, firmly established and a uh, articulated European position. On the other side, the power vacuum that uh, the American retrenchment and uh, the uh, European failure to be there to replace it promptly creates is uh, actually sort of a, the uh, room, living room for new powers, especially, well, new old powers, because I'm speaking, of course, about Turkey and Russia. Uh, it's hard to say that those powers are new, but certainly uh, the space that they, they enjoy is the capacity of maneuver that they enjoy nowadays, and they are 
a way in which uh, they uh, uh, manage to use their military power, their intelligence power, uh, their diplomacy, uh, which is much more, um, much more easy, easier than uh, European countries and uh, in Western countries as such. Certainly, give to uh, give to give to them uh, a lot of room of maneuver. So we have. Turkey, that is increasingly uh, leading a policy uh, of hegemony, uh, siding with the political Islam, and trying to explore it all the voids, uh, already what they achieved in uh, Libya in the more general destruction of the West is pretty, is pretty uh, remarkable. They are there to stay, and we will be obliged to uh, to take uh, this into account. On the other side, Russia, Russia is traditionally seeking uh, warm seas, and a sort of uh, debouché towards the Mediterranean Sea, and they are near to accomplish this. Uh, what we should do uh, on one side, uh, since I am not very optimistic about the possibility for Europe, to develop all in a sudden an organized foreign and security policy. I think that the main European countries should join effort, should coordinate better. One of uh, telling examples of this is the uh, much better relation between Italy and France now they, as far as Libya and Eastern Mediterranean is concerned. And this is a remarkable progress, I would say, and stress, uh, and this is a way in which uh, your main Europe should proceed. On the other side, um, I think uh, that uh, there is still room, and this is maybe a little bit more uh, closer to uh, uh, the subject of the panel. I think that no matter to a certain extent what governments do, I think that there is a huge room for enterprises, for companies to perform in order to create links that, at the end of the day, the governments uh, uh, could not, uh, um, not consider and uh, not be able to, uh, to build on those kind of links that the enterprises and the civil societies, basing and starting from common interests, would have developed. This is a uh, major opportunity and a major chance, I think, that we should as enterprise, this is companies, as you told, I also chair one, which is FinCantA. Uh, we are shipbuilders. Uh, this is uh, a uh, strong, a very important occasion for the private sector and for the uh, companies to uh, make their voice being heard very loudly. Okay, thank you for this analysis. Uh, if I may ask the technician if it is possible to improve the quality of the sound, because I, I do have some difficulty to understand. I, I don't know what's about the public. Uh, so may, maybe for them it's even worse, so if we can make maybe an, another attempt to, to connect. Uh, I would go on with uh, Mr. L. Ainui, also starting from this... Uh, security situation that is not improving or is even getting worse. I mean, what does this mean for the economic of the Mediterranean area? And uh, because we are speaking also about ports, what does that mean for infrastructure? Because infrastructure, that's long-term investments. So, so what's the, the long-term view on economic and on investment in infrastructures, according to you? Please, Mr. Elainawi. Uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, particularly Professor Gilles Keppel, who has uh, uh, invited me and uh, to the organizers. I'm not a security specialist, but uh, what I can, I can tell you is that the uh, um, it is a public good and it is a shared good. So it is the common interest of the countries of the Mediterranean to have a secure and uh, stable environment. Uh, and this is, uh, unfortunately, I guess it has deteriorated, uh, as I can see, uh, and as I said, uh, although I'm not a specialist again, uh, over the past uh, 10 years, I would say, uh, particularly what's happening in Libya, but also multiple foreign interventions, uh, 
uh, and a deeper connection with the Sahel region as well, which is more and more sort of connected to the Mediterranean. Uh, but again, I don't think it is a fundamental impediment to investment in infrastructure in the Med. Uh, if I compare with the rest of the world, I think there is a pretty uh, sort of uh, acceptable environment uh, for cross-border investments, and they are happening in many countries. Uh, if I take Morocco as an example, if you take on average over the past, uh, let's say, 15 years, 20 years, we receive uh, close, close to three percentage points of GDP in net foreign direct investment um, over those 15 years. So, uh, and a, a big chunk of this goes to infrastructure as well. Uh, Morocco itself has heavily invested in network infrastructure. What I would say could be improved in the region, and it's, uh, uh, it's particularly on, on energy. I think we're, you know, doing quite well on ports uh, in, in the Med and this part of the Mediterranean region. Uh, but I see many opportunities, particularly in connecting ourselves in, uh, in energy and uh, uh, namely green energy and uh, solar and wind power that could travel. Uh, on both sides of the Mediterranean. Um, there could be improvement in the way, in the, in the business climate, in procedures, on ports and uh, customs, etc. Although we've made lots of progress since most of the countries in this region, particularly the occidental side of the Mediterranean, have free trade agreement with the, uh, with the European Union. So there's uh, a, a very strong and steady convergence of norms and processes and, uh, uh, and institution has happened uh, uh, over the past, uh, let's say, it's a long process that has started so many years ago. So um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I would say this is one leverage one, one lever which is very important to, to, to stimulate uh, investment in infrastructure, which are by essence in the long run, is finance. Uh, and uh, uh, there I think we could do uh, better in terms of building the institutions uh, to provide long-term finance with the right incentives uh, and the trust building that goes with it and, this, and the underwriting mechanisms that could be uh, built together. Uh, there are existing institutions, such as the European Investment Bank in particular, uh, which can play a fundamental role in funding this long-term uh, investment and funding this uh, trust and underwriting mechanisms. So, uh, this is what I would say at this point. Uh, Mr. Elainu, you spoke about this long-term infrastructure needing to be financed, and before we heard about let's call them new kids in the block, like uh, Russia, Turkey, but also China. Uh, and China is already coming in in many countries with the Belt and Road Initiative, providing money to build ports and other infrastructures. Uh, how do you feel, what, what do you think about the influence that, is, that China is taking in the Mediterranean area, also for financing? Well, uh, this is the trust and the underwriting mechanism I mentioned about. They have internalized all that, basically, through the public sector and the role of the public sector. Uh, you know, providing guarantees, providing the framework, uh, providing the finance, and sort of uh, providing an insurance mechanisms for firms that are often public enterprises. So it gives you... Uh, you know, it gives you uh, an idea of the importance of this kind of mechanism where the market doesn't necessarily provide them, where we have market failures and it's not necessarily na naturally happening, where you need state interventions, where you have very complex coordination mechanism uh, to make this happen. Uh, the example of Tangemed in Morocco is a very good example of uh, uh, beyond the uh, the technicalities of the port, of the capacity of public policies to put together very complex pieces and interaction with foreign investors. I think it's, uh, uh, it's new for a country like Morocco to be able to provide, uh, to, to sort of deliver concretely on a very complex chain uh, 
of uh, of actors and interventions, etc., to 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 deliver such a project. So yes, China is a competitor, of course, is a large, uh, and they have, uh, I I would say, and and understood that, uh, and they found a solution. Uh, I think we there's a space for a more market-based oriented solution with finance. The, the problem is with finance that is as sort of uh, reluctant to to commit in the long run. Uh, and we don't have necessarily, uh, you know, specialized fund here. There are a few of those. Um, may, I think not not enough. And and of course, in close coordination with governments that provide the trust uh, and the underwriting sort of mechanism without getting into subsidies and white elephants. So it's a complex balancing act. Uh, I'm a bit surprised that this discussion is not sort of uh, uh, have intensively happening. Uh, between this side, the, the both sides of the Mediterranean. It happens on specific projects with bilateral countries, but not as a sort of strategic uh, uh, strategic orientation with the, all the, uh, the stakeholders and the, uh, the actors uh, working, working together. Mr. Masolo, we just spoke about China and financing infrastructure, but, but what's the, the impact on security and on politics of this coming in of China in the Mediterranean? Uh, Mr. Masolo, could, could you give you an assessment of this from your point of view? Well, uh, take Montenegro. Uh, we had a, uh, a plan of cooperation between Montenegro and China, uh, building a, a major infrastructure for the country. And now Montenegro finds itself trapped and uh, heavily dependent on China because actually China de facto owns the country that is unable to repay its debt. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, it's not a secret, everybody knows. And uh, I think that from uh, this point of view, uh, people, governments and countries are becoming a little bit more aware and a bit of it uh, more careful. Of course, um, it is difficult to resist, as, uh, in, as this has been stated in the previous intervention, it is complex and difficult to uh, uh, to resist and to uh, and to make appropriate decision on uh, on a, in the case by case and individual basis, uh, this is why I was complaining the lack of, of a more global uh, security framework, uh, which would be um, a Western framework, as it has been the case uh, until today. Which does not mean, of course. Uh, that uh, you don't have to deal with China, that you don't have to partner to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, my point is that uh, you have to do it in a uh, uh, being aware and without being left alone. Uh, from this point of view, I think, uh, as my uh, predecessor in intervention was saying, uh, that uh, we would need a broader uh, regional platform uh, dealing with uh, among the two shores uh, of the uh, Mediterranean, not on a case-by-case -case, um, base, but uh, a little bit more uh, in an organic way. Uh, actually, uh, what we will need uh, in the coming years, five to ten years, we all know that the uh, International Monetary Fund actually estimates that we will need an, in, uh, an intervention in infrastructures and investment in infrastructures of $10 billion in a period of five to 10 years, which means 7% of the GDP, of the uh, global and total GDP. Uh, and of course, uh, this can't be dealt with uh, on, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, how to mobilize? Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, as I was saying, I am convinced that closer cooperation between the main European countries and between the main European countries and the countries of the southern shore of uh, the Mediterranean would be a, a very desirable thing, so uh, uh, international cooperation. 
uh, trying to stimulate international organizations, competent, relevant international uh, uh, organizations to boost uh, the elaboration of common rules and transparency. Once again, we should not leave uh, to China the monopoly of the rule making in terms of how investments are regulated. They are very skillful in operating in multilateral rule setting organizations. We should be more careful. And third, uh, we should try to uh, mobilize uh, investment banks and to promote public private uh, initiatives on a much more active base than uh, until present. Thank you. And on this point, I would like to introduce the, one of the participants of the MEM that is sitting with us here on this panel. That's Ms. Perman, that uh, has a question uh, that is uh, related to this topic. Please, Ms. Perman. Thank you, and also thank you for the opportunity to be here on behalf of uh, fellow young changemakers, and thank you to the speakers for your in-depth answers. Um, so I think we can all agree that in today's reality, many considerations that are not purely economic are affecting the decision-making that in the end is supposed to uh, affect the economic growth of the region. And I'd like to take uh, another example of Europe. Uh, we're here in Europe today. And we're seeing that what maximizes the economy is the borderless transportation of goods. And this is a very uh, optimistic future to look at. But again, we're young change makers and we're looking at the future. I'd like to ask, um, what, what would it take to um, bring the region um, to such a place um, by removing the uh, political constraints and enabling um, the economic development um, that is not just by the political uh, decision-making process that I described earlier. Thank you for the question. Who wants to take it up? Maybe uh, Monsieur Auxerre, who, who, would you like well, to answer to the question by Ms. Perlman? Yes, I, I'm not an expert in economy or neither in, in business, but uh, uh, this question of uh, the free trade area was already raised in the 90s in the Barcelona summit, and uh, 2010 was the target date for, for create, to create this free trade uh, uh, area between the two shores of the Mediterranean. And uh, it didn't work. Why? Because um, it, was, uh, it was a nonsense to, to isolate economic from the other aspects. And the two other uh, speakers uh, of this panel have already uh, underlined it. My, my, my point is that uh, uh, the key... In my view, one of the key point, uh, key uh, elements is the absence of Europe. Uh, you have, we have a, a, a strategic vacuum in this region from the United States, which is now filled by other actors, which are not, uh, uh, I would say, peacemaker. Which we, uh, they are defending their interests, their geopolitical interests, often in confrontation with the interest of Europe, but not only, as well other countries in this region. So there is a clearly a need to fill this vacuum, and Europe has a role to play. And uh, so, uh, you know, Europe is not a player because uh, North, North, northern countries are uh, completely uh, looking out uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, either in Asia, either in East, towards the East. And the south, southern countries of Europe are uh, in competition, are, are, uh, Mr. Masolo uh, was saying. So Italy, France, uh, but as well uh, Spain, uh, uh, Greece, uh, must, must try to, to, to speak with one voice. It was, uh, uh, you know, the, the MET7 uh, initiative tried to, 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 to help it, to, to, to create this uh, single voice uh, focused on the MED and all, uh, to, to have a, a global vision, economic, policy, politics, security, cultural, and so on vision. But uh, clearly, uh, until now, it did not obtain the, the results uh, we, we, we hoped. So there is a place. Uh, uh, there is a, a place for the EU. Uh, more than a place, there is a, a responsibility from uh, uh, European country of the EU. Uh, Mediterranean country of the EU uh, to, 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 to try to, to take the lead of this new uh, 
uh, framework which has to be built. And my second point is that I hand there. Uh, this framework must take into account all the aspects of the situation, security, political, and long-term aspect, not only the economical aspect. Because if, if, if it's not the case, we will uh, go to the same failure that we have done uh, during the 90s. Thank you. What does it satisfy your question? <laughs> On this one, right? Is uh, also Mr. Elinawi? You also want to say something on this one, or about well, the integration? A lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's much more trade between North South than within the South. So uh, most of the countries are, are quite open and have a very high share of imports uh, over 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 GDP. Uh, but in the end, it's difficult to extract uh, yourself from uh, from geopolitical realities. So, uh, but depending on the country, it's very specific. I think uh, if you, you you have to look country by country. But I think I would not be too pessimistic on trade because we have so many trade trade agreements. Uh, of course, y Europe and the Med. But also within the MED, if you take the Agadir Accord uh, agreement, I mean, the spaghetti balls of, of, of trade, of free trade agreements, um, improvements could be made in services, I would say. Uh, uh, and this is also on the table um, and has been for quite a long time with the uh, with job. But I would come back to what was said. I mean, we need uh, something, a grand, a broader vision uh, of uh, objectives and why we're doing things and, you know, the broad dimensions of this partnership um, that has to take into account uh, many, many, many dimensions. And uh, I think maybe it's time for a reset, uh, I would say, uh, in, the, in these relations, uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, sort of exhausted a little bit the uh, uh, sort of the, the momentum that uh, that uh, that has started in the in the in the nineties. So I will converge with the, uh, uh, my predecessor in, in saying that it's a sort of reset in the relations. But again, uh, is Europe ready for a reset of its relation? Uh, what is the political commitment? What is the political capital that uh, you know heads of states are ready to to spend on these issues? Uh, while you have many elections and di di divided internal fronts, uh, recovery of COVID, etc. So I don't want to sound too, uh, too gloomy, but there is a, uh, uh, there, there, there are, these are challenging times. But again, it is in these times that we make progress, uh, as history uh, has shown. So um, my, my recommendation, if I had one to do, is to multiply... Uh, this kind, uh, this kind of uh, initiatives and dialogues, and with young leaders, with think tanks, universities, where we can uh, uh, produce and share common visions and have intense uh, channels of discussions and dialogue that, in the end, may influence politics. Thank you, uh, Senor Massolo. Uh, we spoke about political integration, economic integration. Of, of course, there is a need for infrastructure for this integration. But are all of these investments in seaports, infrastructure in the Mediterranean, aren't already too much? Isn't there the risk of a white elephant, as was mentioned before? Isn't there the risk that everybody wants to be an international hub, but there is not enough traffic for everybody? Could it be that we are over-investing already, anticipating some integration? Please, Mr. Massolo. Uh, well, before answering, I, I, I also wanted to comment a little bit on the previous um, of the previous question raised by our representative of the young leaders. Um, actually, I would broadly agree with uh, the two interventions I heard. Uh, I would uh, add two things, one on the gloomier side, one on the brighter side. On the gloomier side is that, in fact, Europe is distracted. That is we are very much concentrated on our domestic problems. We are uh, engaged in uh, bringing forward the uh, next generation EU plan that requires a huge political, economic, financial 
uh, I would even say, dare to say, moral uh, effort from uh, the side, from uh, from uh, Europe's side. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, concentrated our attentions and will concentrate our attention for for the uh, future and midterm future as well. And all the leaderships in Europe know somebody was mentioning the elections, and this is very true. Uh, we vote a lot in Europe, actually, and uh, voting means that uh, governments tend to seek uh, public approval and to, to look for for support for the part of the uh, public opinions and this influences as well their goals and their perspectives. Uh, so uh, in a way, uh, and on the gloomier side, we will need time. On the brighter side, uh, I would, uh, and this is what I was trying to say before, that is the idea that we uh, that we need also private and enterprise uh, and public opinion and civil society's role uh, to enhance it. Um, we all know Barakana and uh, his theory of functional geography, that is, uh, the geography of interconnectivity, of uh, infrastructure, of uh, links and bonds that connectivity develops, sometimes can be stronger than uh, geopolitics, not always, but sometimes uh, geopolitics or uh, history or uh, purely political calculations, because uh, when you have a link, when you have a cooperation, for instance, in the energy sector, uh, just to mention one of those, uh, you are uh, creating something that is very difficult for governments to bypass. Uh, and this is uh, the role of uh, public opinions to be more demanding, uh, to be less acquiescent uh, and uh, to be satisfied with little, uh, with too little uh, delivery from the side of governments. On the other side, this is what companies broadening the links that exist among uh, them can try to condition, can try to develop a, uh, a network of interconnections that in a way or in another would oblige governments uh, to act. I don't want to sound uh, a little bit too idealistic here, uh, but this is also a component uh, that I wanted uh, to stress the importance of. As far as overinvestment, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of money uh, that is circulating in the world. Uh, we will see um, to what extent this uh, huge liquidity that has been ignited into the uh, global uh, financial system in order to uh, uh, to, 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 I mean, to, uh, to avoid, to, to spare uh, world economy from the worst effects of COVID, of the economic paralysis, of the lockdowns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in a way or in another, will stay while the situation hopefully will improve, and I hope that this will be the case. There will be the new a, um, a, a an issue here: how to sterilize, how to convey this kind of money into a uh, competing, healthy, uh, and uh, legal, I would say, uh, destination of investments. And here, uh, infrastructures uh, is something that is uh, heavily investment consuming and work consuming, but uh, we will have to be uh, very uh, careful uh, in order to choose uh, the, uh, the, des the destination of the investment according to the quality of investment. So I know that the temptation is there uh, to uh, disseminate, uh, to do uh, a little bit everything everywhere, uh, but this is self-defeating and governments, especially governments uh, who, and international cooperation among governments and, the bank, and among financial and investment banks and financial institutions should aim 
at um, I mean uh, trying to uh, to stimulate healthy investments, uh, quality infrastructure, uh, and infrastructures that would really fulfill its task of effective delivery of goods and services and would be localized in uh, parts of territory uh, with backgrounds that would be suitable to, um, un- I mean, to develop the potentialities of, uh, of this kind of investment. Of course, well, well, another dimension here yeah. is sustainability. Uh, because, if we could, uh, well, we'll make this our final question. We are going to the conclusion. If you could uh, okay. make it short. Of course, well, I, I'm just over. That is I, what I was trying to say, <laughs> okay. is that enterprises have a role, and enterprises can build lasting links, and uh, uh, governments have to be uh, very discerning in choosing investments and channeling money to productive and effective forms of investment, not to proliferate uh, too many things in too many places without possibility of delivery of uh, goods and services. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elainau, the, the same question to you. Or are we building everywhere where it is necessary or already doing too much? What's your opinion? <laughs> well, the future will tell. Uh, I think, uh, you know... Uh, not well established investments and uh, unsustainable uh, uh, financially unsustainable investments will uh, will collapse in the end uh, i think uh, you can come have some subsidies at some uh, but not not endlessly so but i would say yes this is this this needs to be a bit more market driven that was my first comment uh, uh, when you asked me about china when it is uh, Sort of when you internalize all the risks, you have no more sort of uh, uh, rational decision mechanism that is taking place. So we need to have firms. And in the end, this, this kind of investments are done by firms. But of course, since it's long term, there's a need for, for the state to, to play its role. Um, uh, uh, so I don't think this is, this, is, this is an issue. And there's also, of course, competition, uh, healthy competition. Some of the countries uh, on this side of the Mediterranean, when I'm sitting, are starting to compete with the European ports, uh, which is, I think, healthy uh, um, you, you, and, and I would say optimal as an economist. So, so I, I don't see that 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 is a big uh, as a as a big issue uh, in, in in the region. Thank you. So uh, I will turn to uh, Mr. Osser, the, the same question, or uh, are all those investments uh, anticipating this integration, this economic development? Is it okay or is it already too much? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I prefer not to answer this question because I'm not an expert on it, but I would like to, <laughs> to, to add something which can be an illustration of what has been said uh, in terms of uh, the your gloomy, brightest aspect of this uh, mix of economic and geopolitical uh, questions which are now completely interacted, interconnected. Uh, I would like to give the example of the gas in Eastern Mediterranean. At, at the same time, uh, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, you know, which uh, br- bring together actors with very, very different positions, such as uh, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, uh, Jordan, Greece, uh, uh, Cyprus, for sure, and, and Italy and France. So that, that's a good aspect of it, which, which shows that uh, countries can uh, uh, collectively op- try to optimize the gains and, and, and so uh, cooperate. That the, le, le, le du commerce Montesquieu, the, the rule of the sweet trade uh, of uh, Montesquieu. At the same time, uh, Turkey policy, uh, now associated with Libya since uh, 19, uh, 2019, uh, shows that it can create a confrontation situation. Uh, which can which can uh, be very uh, very tense and create uh, a lot of tensions. So the same issue, economical uh, with strong economical uh, uh, consequences, 
uh, it's very important for Europe, and you know, it's a lot. There is a lot of money there, and the strategic uh, issues can, on, if if it's well managed, uh, be uh, very positive. And uh, but we have to take into account the fact that there are some geopolitical uh, aspect in this uh, in this uh, issue, and which can uh, have very strong confrontational uh, uh, link. And so it's illustrates, in my view, very well this new world where everything is geopolitical and uh, e even economic uh, and business. Well, thank you very much for these final remarks because uh, we really know economics is important, but it's not just economics. That's, there are many factors playing here. Thank you to all the participants in this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this highly interesting uh, panel. Um, Luca, uh, you said economics is not all, so I would like to uh, just open up the floor as well to the young change, change makers who made it uh, here to Lugano. So is there any question um, from the public? Please. Hello, everyone. Um, just one quick question and reflection. Uh, with the vision and the strategy um, build it at, and they will come, uh, the United Arab Emirates are the great example of collecting investment and capital from all around the world. With your experience and your knowledge, how likely other country in the Middle East can replicate this model uh, where economics is very solid and coexistence of different uh, nationalities, religion, and uh, as well politics uh, exist and coexist in, the, in a a single uh, country. How you see a replication of this model um, in other country? Thank you. Signor Massolo. Uh, in my humble opinion, it has to come from within. It is uh, from individual South and Shore countries. Uh, it would be uh, a little bit uh, tricky uh, to speak about those things exactly while we are seeing such a major failure of what I would call the uh, liberal interventionism, uh, this blatant example of Afghanistan. So I would be very careful uh, I mean, to speak from this, uh, about this kind of things from a Western perspective, it's, it's probably not the case. My point is it has to come from within. It's, it's something that has to be felt by uh, public opinions, civil societies first and foremost. Uh, and uh, my hope is uh, centered and is concentrated on the younger generations. Thank you so much. I think this uh, is an amazing um, and beautiful uh, future-oriented um, closure of this panel. So thank you so much for all the participants. Uh, yes, there were some gloomy or pessimistic uh, predictions, but also some bright ones. And I think that's what this platform is all about, to really you know, find a, a good balanced uh, dialogue, to really talk about things, how they are. Uh, we heard a lot of interesting things about you know, uh, responsibilities of governments, uh, the role of the uh, finance world and the um, you know, private public uh, corporations as well, uh, to really give a new launch uh, to all these you know, big infrastructure um, programs. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana. We are still talking about the Mediterranean, the MENA region, and the challenges on the economic, uh, economics and the relation between the security situation and the improvement of the uh, economy situation. And actually, uh, we heard some words about that there is some, still some pessimism, but I would ask, to Mr. Bergamini, and first of all, thank you for being with us. If you can give us your uh, perspective about your company and how has been the last, I would say, year, because after COVID, we saw indeed some signs of improvement. It's correct. It's correct. Thank you so much, first, for the, for the question and the opportunity. Um, Yes, very challenging times, very challenging. Uh, this pandemic uh, challenged the economy of the world, 
since more than a year now, and uh, it's challenging the economy of the Mediterranean region, it's challenging all the companies, and particularly shipping companies also. Um, especially also uh, because now COVID was a very strong and tough brutal reminder about the strategic uh, characteristic of the supply chains. All is about supply chain now. It's not even me or our company which is saying that. Uh, this year, the G7 summit, it was the first time since the G7 exists that the leaders at their annual summit uh, were mentioning uh, supply chains. It was the very first time in the history of G7, once again, that you had, in, not in each paragraph, but something about the strategic aspects of the supply chains. Uh, supply chains to be holistic, resilient, etc., etc. So, yes, um, and it has been ending, I was just saying you, because I will give you three examples. Congestion. Congestion in the ports, uh, not only in the Mediterranean region, of course, but from Asia to uh, North America. Uh, supply chain congestion uh, has been caused and is still caused by unprecedented surge of imports in the US, but also in European markets, or also in the world. The US congestion is a big challenge for us and has impacted uh, all the activities of the, the shipping companies. Uh, vaccination, vaccination of the CFAs. Also, of course, vaccination is a challenge for all the governments and the countries of the planet, but also for seafarers, which are who are pivotal, who are really essential staff for keeping uh, supply chain efficiency. And also, um, still talking about the challenges that we are facing, um, the uh, cargo crunch, what we call uh, in, in my job, in my profession, a cargo crunch. We have to know that there, is, there are not enough vessels and containers on the planet to satisfy the demand. I was talking about the surge of imports. Uh, there are not enough vessels, so it has been complicated also to, to, to find all the vessels, even if we are talking about massive, gigantic vessels uh, for the world leaders that we are, uh, but also containers, just for the anecdote, which is not an anecdote. Uh, we have to know that before COVID, there were only two companies all over the world which were able to, to, to fabric, to make, to produce containers. So very scarce resources. Nevertheless, nevertheless, to, 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 to finish my answer to the question, uh, we, have, we, have been, we have been good as usual. CMSCGM is a very, very and the other European leader in companies in shipping industry who are very solid, very resilient, and who have succeeded to overcome all these challenges. Um, the business is very strong. Uh, last week, I was reading a contribution, an article from a, a think tank in Washington, Middle East uh, Institute, very famous one in Washington, saying that CMSCGM is playing a central role in the Mediterranean, which is true from Morocco to Malta, uh, from Egypt to Turkey, from Greece to, to France, of course, in Marseille, where we have our head office historically, Lebanon also, despite the, the very, very particular times and the big crisis which is hitting Lebanon now, you know, our company has... Uh, his roots, his origins in, in Lebanon. So um, we, we see that this is a pivotal region um, with a strategic company at very challenging times. Uh, we are currently uh, serving in uh, 160 countries, 110,000 staff, and we have close to 20% of our staff working in the Mediterranean regions on various countries of the Mediterranean Sea. So very challenging, but uh, we are doing the job. So you mentioned the pivotal region, you're based in France. We've been talking also about the role of Europe in this context. So the challenges, the t challenges I, you mentioned, but also uh, we heard during the panel about the kind of uh, lack of presence, or actually even more uh, clear and blatant, Europe was absent during this uh, situation during this crisis in a way. So if on the economical point of view, despite some challenges, the situation uh, kind of improved, uh, we saw, or somebody of some of our speakers say, we, we could see some uh, lack of, of presence of Europe. Do you share, do you agree with this opinion that if we look at the Mediterranean, uh, not only as um, an uh, economic opportunity, but also as a strategic field, uh, Europe has been, at least recently, absent? No, I disagree. I disagree for various reasons. First, because uh, as a former French diplomat and pro-European, 
the European DP convinced itself under the EU flag for many years, and Europe and uh, its actions all over the planet in various sectors has always been criticized because ju- Europe is a journey. Uh, of course, nothing is perfect, but it, nobody says it to be easy or perfect. Uh, when we talk about security threats, when we talk about crisis in the Mediterranean region, uh, and the capacity of the European capitals and European Union um, to answer, to provide solutions and crisis solution, what are we talking about exactly? Are we talking about hard security, soft security? Uh, is the situation of today worse than it was yesterday, better than the situation of tomorrow? Uh, when is yesterday, when is tomorrow? We, we don't know, you know, short, medium, long term, all that. Uh, is uh, maybe not uh, facilitating the answer, but first it's true that uh, we have to think in terms of neighborhood. Uh, We know from my previous life, my previous career, when I was working with uh, the first EU chief diplomacy, Javier Solana, a long time ago, we know that if you want to have an impact, a local impact, you need to think globally and vice versa. If you want to be a global player, you need also to be able to have a stabilized neighborhood. This is all the narrative about what Europe is trying to do since more than 20 years and even further since Amsterdam Treaty. Once again, is it perfect? Is it enough? I don't know, but when you ask the question that if Europe and European companies have a role to play or are able to play, I will give you two examples. Uh, Economic development and political stability. Uh, you cannot have political stability without economic development. But we know also, and I've seen that physically in my previous posting abroad on the southern short difference, uh, political transition is all about freedom of expression, free and fair elections, good governance, accountability. And this is fundamental. When this is in the making and when this is successful, even if the, the journey is a bit bumpy with up and down, you know, like a rock but political transition, without economic transition, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. You cannot have a proper transition being able to faire bouger les lignes towards more democracy, more accountability, better governance, if you don't have these transitions, political and economic transition. Who better than Europeans and European companies with their values uh, are better placed to promote these values for economic development and um, stability in the southern neighborhood. Uh, who else? Uh, second anecdote, uh, I was mentioning soft and hard security. Um, if I talk about human security, uh, we have to talk about green, climate action. Uh, we have to play together north and south in the Mediterranean and Middle East region, in Mare Nostrum, we have to play collectively, this is so obvious, uh, to fight this climate change. Uh, and if you take the shipping companies like CMACGM, uh, this is a very strong stance that we have taken with massive investments since almost 10 years now. And uh, for the very first time, some green vessels, containers vessels since more than a year now, propelled with LNG, uh, with a substantial reduction of gas emission, but also um, doing well in terms of uh, submarine biodiversity. Uh, we have opened this new field and playing for decarbonation uh, for the maritime transport, which is once again strategic and pivotal. And we are very, very pleased now that the other European companies, other European companies, European carriers uh, are following that, following that journey, uh, like the German company APAC, the Italo Swiss company, Mediterranean Ship and Company, uh, Maersk, the Danish company, has just today announced also that it's ready by 24 to move forward with a neutral vessel with new technology. Uh, so the top five on the world leaders of maritime industry, um, maritime transportation, the five biggest companies, four are Europeans. So when you have the four maritime companies which have decided to, to move forward and to, to really work uh, in a very uh, in good intelligence and with strategic dialogue 
For instance, with the European Union Commission, with its vice president, Mr. Franz Timmermans. And this is complex, this is complicated, uh, it imposes massive investment, uh, but this is very important also, once again, to, uh, to improve security and the future of Mediterranean. You know, we move from immigration, terrorism, that kind of hard security threats, to all the commitments uh, for which the future of the region will depend of the capacity, capability of Europeans, Europe and European companies to be able to play collectively, to move forward. That's my personal assumption. Thank you so much, Mr. Begavini, for being uh, with us, for sharing your thoughts, and we really touch different perspectives on uh, the Mediterranean from your point of view. We heard previously uh, um, some other speakers uh, touching issues related more to security and to the um, uh, security in the region and with the economy. So it's really uh, um, complicated topics. We try to uh, summarize it, and we really uh, got to different points. So I really appreciate you being with us. And and now I give back the floor to Diana. Now I would like to hand over again to Emiliano Boss, this time with the uh, interview with the young change maker from Saudi Arabia. Ahla Zahla. Diana, thank you so much. So once again, we we shift from the global stage, from the conversation on the Mediterranean and the economics, the crisis and the tensions in the area, to some more, I would say, optimistic view. The daily life of one of our uh, participants to the MEM. Thank you so much, Imam Al Haji. Welcome and thanks for uh, Thank our conversation. So, uh, can I start asking you to tell us a little bit more about you? Uh, Iman Al Haji uh, from Saudi Arabia. I I lived in the U.S. for six years. And then I came back uh, a PhD candidate in material science and engineering at KAUST, KAUST uh, with more hundred internationalities. A mother of two sons and uh, what else? Um, can go forever, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. It's, it's already a lot. There are a couple of details. Uh, I, I'll stop you on your biography. Um, you mentioned you have been living in the US and then you moved back to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you, you're studying, you're, you're researching as a PhD student and, and a candidate in, in a big campus. Uh, can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more of how many nationalities are there? You just mentioned the numbers, but what does it mean? Is it a kind of a, uh, because we might have an impression that uh, not many people are going to Saudi Arabia to study, but you're telling me a totally different um, picture, a totally different story. What is it about? Yeah, let me tell you the case of the, the organization that I founded, Students for Sustainability. Yeah where we advocate for uh, sustainable development. For So for this organization, we have, uh, I think, for the board members, more than 10 nationalities, Americans, Europeans, uh, France, and others, Italians, uh, from Africa, from Asia, so from all around the world, we uh, speak in a common language as international citizen or citizen of this planet Earth. At the end, we share one planet, and there is no uh, planet B, right? Yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. And, and why, why you wanted to create, to start this kind of a, a student group that is focusing on the sustainability on, on the only planet we have? Yeah, we are in a very urgent time. And as stated by the, uh, by the United Nations, this is a decade of change, a, de a decade where we have to act to preserve this ecosystem because we're reaching this tipping point of uh, our uh, earth boundaries where we need to uh, rethink of our uh, economic growth, environmental practices, and also social uh, justice, where we believe that true sustainability or sustainable development is within the intersection of, the, of these three spheres. That's very interesting that it's coming from a country that has been for a long the biggest oil producer in the world. It's competing with the U.S., but anyway, one of the biggest for, for, for years, forever. So, uh, and, and actually, you are living and studying in a country that um, is maybe already thinking, but it has to think about the post-oil 
society, mm -hmm. post oil economy. Are you working on that? Yes, I'm currently uh, doing uh, nano carbon materials research for energy storage for batteries, for smart grids, for renewables, for electric vehicles. So definitely there is a huge potential and a huge investment on this sector. We see with mega projects like NEOM, other things, the country definitely is shifting to renewable energy and wants to be a leader in that sector as well. So, and we have to act fast, not just like in a strategic plan and to move forward as well. A couple of quick points. You mentioned the electrical vehicles. I'm a bit curious to know, are you driving yourself in yes. Saudi Arabia? Uh, yeah, I, I have the privilege to drive and I learned it when I was in the US. Any difference? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that uh, Saudi roads are a bit uh, larger, uh, much larger. In the US, they were very tiny and, uh, and we have to squeeze in different places. And I think in the... In Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, we love things to be always large and, you know, excessive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and last point, there is a, a role that you might be take as a, as a young change maker along with uh, your fellow colleagues that are here sitting with us in Lugano at, at the MEM. So what would be your uh, field, your role to change something if you could, or what are you working on? You mentioned already, but if you focus on something specifically. Yeah, definitely I aspire to drive change towards sustainable development. And what I see is missing is the bridge between academia and industry and policy making. So uh, my dream job is to link them and to make better strategic decisions for the future linking the intellectual minds with the political uh, minds and industrial minds. Shukran, thank you, Imam Al-Haji, for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And now I'm uh, honored and happy to give the floor back to Diana. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to introduce the last panel of uh, today's rich uh, program, and I'm very happy to introduce this very interesting theme, Rethinking Food Systems in the MEM region. This is an amazingly forward-looking uh, theme as well, and I would like to welcome um, on screen today uh, with Skype, because we know that we're in a hybrid format today, Marie-Laure Creta um, Corredor. She is the head of global program food security at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation here in Switzerland. So, bienvenue, Marie-Laure. Thank you. The next panelist is uh, Giorgio Marapodi. He is the Director General for Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in Italy. Benvenuto. Uh, grazie. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Very warm welcome to Pio Van Obst, the Ambassador at the Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the United Nations Organization in Rome. Welcome to Lugano. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. All the way from Iran, we have the young changemaker, Amin Emadi. So happy to have you here. You had a long week with the seminar with all the other changemakers here in Lugano. So happy to have you on stage. And the chairman of this last panel of the day is uh, Emiliano Albanese. He's professor at the Università della Svizzera Italiana. Warm welcome and please launch this panel. So very well, good afternoon for myself as well and uh, it's a pleasure to be in person with two panelists and uh, virtually with two more panelists and uh, I think that this facility having big screens is making them even more visible uh, to myself as well so it's going to be very interactive and I think that um, even though they say all the times that the last is not the least of the panel um, I think that food um, systems and policies in general are so much across the board when we talk about politics, cultures, and many other aspects, including health. 
So as a professor of public health, I've been working in public health uh, that touches also uh, public health nutrition. But I think that um, what we want to discuss here today with these uh, uh, distinguished panelists is a, a broader perspective, uh, and which is not just cultural. And I will, without any further ado, I will start with, um, uh, with a question to um, uh, Dr. Marrapodi. I will start from uh, an, any, an, an Italian perspective, because I would like um, Dr. Marrapodi to help us set a little bit of the stage, because we are in the middle of an extremely interesting process with the United Nations Summit due in a few weeks from now, which has been though preceded by a pre-summit. So I think that my question is, why does a UN summit on food systems require a pre-summit, which was held at the end of July in Rome, in I think a very hot uh, weather and probably environment. So what happened in Rome? Why did you need a pre-summit? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Albanese. Thank you for, for, for this question. But let me first say that it was uh, an incredible uh, huge effort on our side to organize this pre-summit jointly with, uh, of course, with the team of uh, the special envoy, Mrs. Calibata, and, uh, and with the friends and colleague of, uh, F of FAO. Uh, the role uh, to the role of Italy, uh, let me start from there, as you mentioned in the preparation of the summit. We, I think we have been a steady steering partner because of our deep involvement in food security through the Italian Development Cooperation. We worked with the United Nations to make sure that the summit would not only be a, a moment of uh, declarations, but a process, a process which would bring into focus the complexity of, uh, of production uh, systems, uh, the need to adapt them to the challenges of our times. An appointment that uh, could benefit from the analysis and which would highlight those systems and values that the Italian food system and culture embody. In order to achieve this goal, an intermediate stage was necessary, we think, and we thought that uh, could not uh, be a better place than Italy, let me say that, but I mean, it's uh, not it's not only for uh, because of, um, of uh, the uh, culture and tradition and all the efforts that we uh, traditionally put in the uh, in the food uh, um, subject, but also because Rome is the um, is the place of the Rome-based agencies. So it's uh, a sort of a the natural place where to prepare the work, the the final summit. And I believe I believe that the pre-summit demonstrated all this and actually achieved the goal. Because and now from um, there is a list of action. Uh, call to actions, a list of coalitions, and I think that from there to September, the 23rd of September, as it was announced, we can advance with uh, more awareness and um, also with a conviction that uh, there is no predefined path. Um, there is a, a package of, uh, there is no package of easy and prompt remedies but there is a set, and there should be a set of solutions which can improve our approach to food systems, taking inspiration from what already works. And, and this has been a, a subject that we have discussed also in these days. I'm, I'm uh, connected with you from Rimini, maybe. Uh, you know, there is the, uh, this is the 41st year of the meeting of Rimini, the meeting of peoples. And uh, the... Uh, the subject of food security and the changing food system was also was central also here really in these days. Well, thank you very much. And to me, I just wanted also to um, move back a little bit to a few definitions. So with the health system, we essentially uh, uh, mean all activities, actors, resources, all that we do in society, but also at an individual level to 
produce, process, distribute, and eventually consume uh, food. But I think that because we are in the SDGs era, and that is essentially uh, a common uh, set of goals, 17 in total, uh, across the board, we can focus about probably food and hunger in goal two. Um, and of course, health in goal three, which pertains particularly myself. But we have been taught and we tell people that uh, interactions across all goals is much more important than focusing on targets on a specific goal. So we are not working individually on these of goals. I think uh, that um, food systems are essentially one that most of people, most people would recognize. And the summit, the UN summit in, in New York is actually a people summit. It's participated by all sorts of uh, kind of uh, constituencies uh, from uh, civil society and also at an individual basis, which I think is because uh, this is a topic that everybody understands that is really across the board. Uh, but I think that uh, I would like to ask to Pio uh, what we mean with the concept of transformation of uh, health systems. Transformation of health systems or food systems or both? Uh, yes, food systems. Let's put both. Anyway, they are so much interlinked <laughs> because actually food systems and, and determinants, including social determinants of health, are so much related. And this basically uh, takes me to indicate one of the reasons why we've been supporting for four years in a row in, with the thematic approach is the MEM is simply to make sure that the young change makers that are here present and made all the journey here, they, they see that there is a way to, to start tackling the issues that are being described this morning, like uh, the ones from the, from the minister, the excellency minister of foreign affairs of Oman that was talking about uh, um, uh, social equity and I was talking about peace. The peace needs to go through social equity, but then still is this is difficult. And then the point is that why not link it with some specific thematic approaches that are showing you that actually you can start working something very concrete to in order to move so towards this famous social equity in relation also to sustainable businesses and so on and so on. We did once with uh, uh, Blue Peas, which was uh, water, transboundary water management, followed by exactly discussion on determinants of health, including the social one. Because behind what you're saying is a cost. When we're talking now in, two, in the food system, there's something maybe I mean you're gonna talk about, I don't know, but we are discussing a lot about the true costs of food. No? And usually we think about climate change and the costs of zero kilometers and so on. Right? What about the true values? What about the fact that you are spending much less money in health systems that have to respond to health-related issues that are caused by the improper, or if you want, the not, the not, pro, not making the best out of the food in terms of determinants of health? you could imagine that you could have a value there that leads also even to reduce the cost of the of health system. So the, link, the linkage is there, of course. Therefore, yes, SDG3, SDG12, sustainable consumption and production. But let me just bring a message to the young ones because they came on purpose here. Somebody asked me um, why, 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 why being here, um, and I asked also why being here. Um, you know, a little bit, a little bit from... Um, maybe from a philosophical aspect, I think that between 25 and 35 years, mm -hmm. it's your age more or less that you're participating here, this is a time where you are fixing your age. It's a time where you're becoming old or you're going to stay young forever. And the young forever comes with hope, comes with the possibilities of having something to, in, to share, something in common, where you want to build something together, even though it's difficult, acknowledging that there is a lot of things where there is here we agree to disagree, but find this seed, talking about food, that makes the basis of some kind of first maybe discussion, then maybe some projects, some activities are going together. This is the reason why we brought the food system, which is a UN discussion, very strong discussion today, but actually it's very strong related to the future of the whole region. Because of course behind the food and food production and consumption there is the uses of resources, water scarcity. You made on Saturday, I mean, the issue, the, the very point, strong point about the, something that all the region has in common, scarcity of water. It's trying to find, in try, in, instead of trying to find a national way to food security, by simply indicating food sovereignty. Why not start talking, how can we in the region work together in order to make sustainable production and consumption 
in the region that includes also the proper use of resources like water and tackles inequalities and therefore social determinants of health. I don't know if I answered a little bit to your question, but at least I'm trying to go in this direction. Yeah, but yeah, no, thank you very much, because this is really the spirit of the panel that we bring in um, into the debate, not just all my questions, but through your answers, important topics. And food security is a central topic in the SDG. Of course, in SDG 2, it's especially mentioned. So I wanted to ask to Marie-Laure uh, Creta, who is uh, following us uh, remotely, that uh, in some ways, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, of course, had, had a obvious impact on food systems. But did it also um, unveil or highlighted criticisms and problems and challenges that were pending and that became prominent at a, on a global scale? Because the pandemic is global by definition. So that all countries may be seen as developing countries when it goes into uh, food uh, systems. W what do you think, uh, Madame uh, Creta? Can you give us a perspective from, from your viewpoint, which is a special one? Yeah, I think from, from a Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and in particular our global program Food Security, we've been looking uh, at the whole uh, situation uh, now for, for a few months, uh, seeing actually a deterior deterioration of, of the condition and, and definitely uh, there is a need for more um, resilience strengthening. And um, this is a usual approach we have in many regions uh, in the world, and especially, I would say, also in the MENA, in the MENA region. So when we speak about resilience, it's uh, reducing the vulnerability of population, but of, also of, of ecosystem. And there are different modalities to work on that. And I think uh, there is now a strong call to work more in a nexus approach. What is a nexus approach is that you are able at the same time to look at uh, long-term uh, development issues and being able to answer with a more uh, type of emergency response. And how do you do that? You, you need actually to have a kind of different institutional setup. Uh, you need to have your staff being ready to step into a new ways of working quite rapidly. And uh, actually, our direction is currently going through an organize, a reorganization, sorry. And um, part of, of the objective is actually to have this nexus being stronger. And there we see also the necessity to have this systemic approach going beyond food. And as you just mentioned in the previous uh, point, to look at at the, not only health and food, but I would say the whole economic dimension and, and what is required for that. Within the um, Switzerland the strategy for the coming years, we speak about the four Ps, prosperity, planet, people, and peace. And actually, you, you need to tackle all these issues uh, at the same time and, and Definitely, we have just discussing last uh, week with other colleagues that the biomedical response to COVID is a part of the response, but can't be the only one. And we see with a lot of concern that actually uh, a food insecurity crisis is now happening, and it's a direct consequences of the COVID-19, but definitely also of the whole economic uh, distress. Well, thank you very much. And uh, four Ps, a fifth P, the perspective, the perspective of the young change maker. Did you debate, I mean, amongst you? Can you summarize a little bit of what emerged? And did you touch upon last Sunday, for instance, where you are highly interactive, also uh, food systems uh, from the region, which is highly diverse. It's we're talking about hundreds of millions of populations across a highly diverse geographically and cultural uh, uh, environment that is, from many perspectives, and your perspective as a young change maker, I think interesting to hear uh, if anything emerged uh, during your interactions last Sunday. Of course. Uh, well, I would like to uh, basically, yes, project what we have discussed, but also to remind that I'm also uh, talking on behalf of another movement, Bites of Transformation, but also being a member of the MEM Summer Summit. And uh, 
Actually, in our discussions yesterday, which was very interesting for all of us, we uh, talked about the topic of identity. And uh, we all uh, were agreeing that it's, of course, better to talk about what unifies us rather than what divides us from each other. So speaking about the reality of our region, uh, I would like to focus on what unifies us uh, that is relevant to our food systems and how we can build hope in it if we all work together hand in hand and, and be unified. So it's, it's quite interesting that if we go under the label of our countries, we might be very divided, but only just changing the name of MEM, having Middle Eastern and Mediterranean summit, we are all in one region. So it's, it's really tricky to basically not to lose our identity or it's also upon us to choose what identity we want to pick. So uh, we all, uh, in our countries, I mean the major productions maybe would be, in the, I mean the countries that we have with major production that we have is, is agriculture. But what, we, what unifies us is, what things that can unify us is, can, could be the, the climate, uh, the, the water scarcity, as Pio mentioned, that we have in the region, and uh, also, also the, the, the diet, the type of food. We have many similarities, not only in our language, in our culture, but also in our food culture in the region. So this also means that we have the same uh, habits, we have the same uh, behavior in, in food consumption and food production, which uh, needs to change because uh, the, the climate is changing, the, the, the population is growing, of course we understand this, but what unifies us is also these conflicts that we have to come up with a unifying solution as well. So coming up with new narratives and, and, and advocating those new narratives in our own countries. And uh, just as I mentioned in the past about the identity problem, we, we kind of all came together, we had this emotional uh, conversations that we really wish that there was no barriers, there was no uh, barriers that we, there were, there was an option that we could uh, tear down these barriers and unify and just become one territory rather than being one country. For instance, like the concept of EU, that you can travel to different countries without any barrier, without any need to show a passport or something. So uh, we know that we do have this potential. So uh, this is, again, another thing that unifies us is our identity, identity problem, identity case, let's say, crisis that we have. And... Uh, we have to define our habitats in a new way by, make, by, by uh, committing to make a new social change, also related to the food systems, like the diversity of food systems. Diversity of food systems is not only about food when we are talking about food systems, it of course includes the people, the people who are active in these food systems. So uh, we, need to be, we need to understand the current realities that we have and we need to adapt to those. And this includes changing the food that we produce, changing the food that we consume by uh, recognizing the current situation of, of, the, uh, of the current uh, crisis that we have in the region, mostly to, to, because of the climate, which is again a main driver of other political issues that we have in the region. And uh, then I want to talk about the role of youth, which is us, that we are here in the MEM Summit. That, uh, regardless of any conflicts that is between our countries, we found this space here to all come together and uh, share all the things that we have in common, everything that unifies us. And what we can do, how we can magnify this, is to go back to our countries, go back to our people, to start raising awareness about this and explain to people that why we need to renew our traditions, why we need to make shifts in our cultures, in our consumption cultures, in our production cultures, to have a more sustainable food future in the food systems. And another thing that unifies us is that we have a lot of intelligence. We all know that in the region. We have immigration of brains, intelligence, going all abroad, if not all, half of the, let's say, half of the United States or Europe 
is now built upon with the help of the immigrants that are coming from our region. So why not keeping, why not investing on the same capacities that we have in our countries? Of course, we don't have this space at the moment, but we have to do that, but, and, and we can do that even faster than before by the help of digitalization and knowledge, which we do need this help and support, of course, uh, by, by, becoming to, by coming together and complementing each other. And I will just be quick, sorry. And uh, about the culture and our learning. So we know that we have a rich culture, and this is a, a very strong resource that we can rely on to uh, basically to, to reduce, <coughs> reduce some inefficiencies that we have in our food systems in terms of the true uh, value and the affordability of food. We know we have a strong culture of not wasting food, but maybe in the new generation, some of them is getting forgotten, but by remembering ourselves, by becoming conscious, we can bring those back, bring those habits back. And uh, to finish, what I just would like, a sort of statement that I made is that what unifies us again at the end is that today we know that our region is the today's region of conflict, but let's not forget that our region was the place of the first settlements of human being that created the new way of doing agriculture, and we are the region who defined food security. So we can definitely go back there by coming together, by being unified again. That was well, what I wanted to share. Well, thank you very much. I think it, I, I, I let you speak because I think that you, um, you are speaking on behalf and for many people. And it's extremely interesting for us to have this contribution. But Dr. Marapodi, what unifies the region is, of course, a diet, which has a variety of staple foods, and we call it the Mediterranean diet. However, why did not emerge in the pre-summit a recognition, an official recognition that the Mediterranean diet is a healthy dietary pattern with a great deal of scientific evidence, but most of all, a long tradition of healthy societies that stem out for this diet and not just from a nutritional point of view. So what happened there? I don't know. I think, I think you are trying to, to try to be provocative. Well, of course, I'm for sure I'm a great supporter of the Mediterranean diet. But, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, it is important in a multilateral system to involve the largest number of participants and to reach and to reach a consensus. So there should be there should be common principle on which you can uh, uh, involve really everybody. So I think that ch changes only happen if uh, if they are done together. This then this does not mean that we have forgotten the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet, and the other traditional diets in uh, in coalitions in the coalitions which were approved in. Uh, in, in Rome at the, end, at the end of July. We have rather concentrated on more general issues, but if you look closely, um, I, I would say that the, the Mediterranean diet uh, emerged uh, in, uh, in a sort of, in, a, in, a, in an horizontal way in, uh, in, all, uh, in all decisions that uh, um, that have been uh, taken in, uh, in Rome. Uh, what we say, and I think that we have demonstrated for years, is not only in, uh, in Italy, but in the whole area of the Mediterranean, is, uh, is, that, is that our way of eating is, uh, is a diet anchored to a cut to the culture and the needs of uh, all which has had centuries to refine and adapting to circumstances which are the ones that can respond to the need for a balanced, balanced nutrition for, for adults and children. By harvesting what the earth and the sea offer us, uh, but in a, a sustainable way. Uh, the Mediterranean diet is a diet which can avoid waste, can guarantee decent work. And of course, this uh, cannot be done without constant updating of technology and financial resources. So the approach that we have taken 
in uh, in Rome is uh, that we don't want to contrast the uh, application of technology to the to agriculture to the rural system but of course what uh, what we have tried to underline and i think that is uh, it is uh, it's really uh, emerging from uh, from the old discussion is that we should take into account not only the mediterranean diet but all the tra all the tradition of of local food because in the, in the local tradition, I think that there are centuries and centuries of wisdom. Uh, of course, we uh, we should not only look at the past, and not, uh, we should not look at the present, but we should look at the future, having in mind what we have learned from the past and uh, uh, and the way we are living in the present. Well, Thank you very much. I think so. It's a, it's a partial win. I think it's a recognition that Mediterranean diet may not be named, but it's definitely there culturally. So I think uh, that Ambassador uh, Van Wooster, it's important because all the panelists here have been involved in a, in a project which uh, has been named. So we want to hear more uh, about these bites of Transfood Nation. But I think that what I would like to highlight is what has emerged in the very many instances of interactions uh, of the project from the bottom, from the field participation, and what it means uh, to be transformative uh, through a project that is highly inclusive and that, of course, involved uh, Switzerland and Italy particularly, but many, many also uh, who are here. Thank you. Actually, I, the best, the best um, one entitled to speak about the results of uh, the project up to now, Bicep Transformation, will be a mean. But uh, what I can say how this, the journey started with, between that we started with Switzerland and Italy, and it started actually <laughs> exactly, but I think somehow by Switzerland joining the group of friends of. Uh, of a Mediterranean diet, being us an Alpine, an Alpine country, we could say the Alpine diet. But at the end, what what would we be underlining is a system, is a system that is really linking the way you have uh, family farmers that are that are busy in Switzerland. The very the, the connectivity between the rural and urban is very strong. So you have to take into consideration when you are producing, you have to take into consideration that you are near urban settlements. So you have to consider from the very beginning the sustainable use of resources, whether we had just a vote on pesticides. Some people can see it as a, something negative or positive, but the mere fact that we were discussing and, and, and voting on certain issues, all the population, this means this is, there is a debate and there is a link between rural and urban that is one of the main issues that came out from the Project Bites of Transformation. So the, 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 the journey started, started like this together, first beginning a couple of countries and in at large immediately with the discussion of the, with the organizer of the MEM with the region, with the Middle East Mediterranean region, and then again it started to be larger and larger. And then now we have uh, Latin Americans, we have uh, Asia, and we have every, every young ones that is actually looking for, for a kind of a vision. Because at the end, what the, the young ones came up with, uh, with this uh, manifesto that has been, by the way, translated in, I don't know, 37 or 40 languages by themselves, huh? with no financial support whatsoever, um, it's basically a vision. A vision that, is, that came from projecting yourself into a future. So exactly, take into consideration you have health issues that now are clearer. You have urbanization, population dynamics, you have climate change, and so on. If it's not too difficult to project, man, you can project yourself in a negative manner, very easy. Everyone is doing it today. Uh, we, we will be dead soon. But, but use this information instead of projecting yourself to create your own future, the future, but you need a start. How can you talk about something unifying if you don't have a common vision? Unifying is a very nice word, but if you don't have a common vision, you are not going to be unified in nothing, and, and particularly in food systems, because food systems so, are divisive. I, I think, thank you very much. We'll come back to the, um, to the manifesto in a moment, but very quickly, Madame um, Greta, I would like you to talk uh, a little bit about unifying the approaches that we have in food systems, humanitarian and cooperation approach. Can you tell us what is the divide and why that may be problematic? 
Well, as I was mentioning earlier on, um, you have different modalities, ways of tackling these issues, and a bit different uh, silos in how you do it. And, and definitely, we need to unify uh, that and look at the same time, basically, at the, the causes of, of the issue and, and the answer. And uh, we have some interesting examples, for instance, in Lebanon, where we had to uh, deal with an issue on uh, water management. And at the same time, you work on the integrated water resources management and governance. Uh, in a situation where you have a host communities and, and refugees and actually you take the different stakeholders together and, and find a solution which is a solution for all. And for that, you need some specialists that have different skills and uh, at the same time you will address the cause, you will give an answer and access to water to many people and at the same time you contribute also some peace building activities. I think this unifying approach is, is feasible, but uh, needs to be now a bit more mainstream, probably, in, in many of our uh, interventions. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, the manifesto was aimed, so I mean, I would like you to uh, sort of, we're nearing the conclusion of this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, so not just what is the key message in a nutshell of the manifesto, but to whom is this message addressed? Who are we talking to? Who are you talking to with the manifesto translated now in 27 languages all over the world? Sure. So the manifesto comes as a commitment and it starts from every individual ourselves. And it's a commitment from us to first commit to all of the chapters in the manifesto. And then if you believe in that and if you know you are surrounded by the like-minded people, start to share this and raise awareness and find your community, create your community with this manifesto for this movement that you want to have forward. And uh, can I just make a comment on, uh, let's say for instance, the humanitarian, very just quick. very quick. So uh, we also shared, because this was something that came upon uh, our, our discussions and conversations about the humanitarian aid, especially in the, in the region. So we thought that maybe the current way of humanitarian aid is not the most sustainable and maybe the not best that is suitable for this region because what we are seeing nowadays is that the end product, which is only the food, is just being provided as a humanitarian aid for dealing with food security issues, while investing on infrastructure for food, security, for food system is better, because currently the, maybe some of the humanitarian aid that is coming to these countries is not really uh, solving the problem, although it can be even damaging the health of the people because it's coming from a different con context. To, 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 to this region. So it has to be built upon from a bottom-up approach with proper infrastructures in the region. So this would be maybe a more efficient way to invest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think so we, we get into the end of the panel. And I think that what uh, I would like to encourage everybody to do is these days we can Google anything. I just wanted to be a bit, a bit more specific about uh, the bites of trans food nation because I think that in the name, when you Google it, you will see the key message of uh, this fantastic uh, endeavor and project. Because I think that we named the summit at the very beginning of, of, of this panel um, that will happen in, in, uh, in New York. So where the United Nations are essentially based, I would like to remark the fact that exactly like the MEM, with participants from the region who are highly diverse, the summit in, in New York will be a highly diverse summit. So it's the, all the constituencies are not representing only institutions. And it is because we have a good recognition that food systems need the help and the participation, not only of large institutional organizations, but also of individuals. And I think that is emerged quite clearly in this panel that we all eat, we all enjoy food and we want it to be nutritious and sustainable. We want that every meal that we consume will contribute towards attaining the goals of the SDGs and not just two and three, so food and health. But I think that we do appreciate the complexity, but also the inner motivation of making better uh, food systems to better societies at large and not just health, but the society overall. So uh, I will allow uh, Ambassador Pio, because he's next to me, to have a closure remark. The closure remark is a people summit should become a legitimate summit. It's legitimacy that's at stake, basically. This is the reason why it's called a people summit. 
It's not the, what is legal in terms of intergovernmental negotiations, but is the process that uh, Giorgio referred to is the one that is, is offering the legitimacy, the legitimacy of what we're doing. And by the way, the Bites of Transformation is an independent dialogue inscribed in this process. So we wish you all the best uh, to have an impact in New York, of course, and the pre-summit have certainly contributed to it. And to some extent, also the MEM and uh, the, the young uh, people who contributed to the MEM these days and brought uh, their thoughts to this debate. So thank you very much to the panelists, and thank you very much all for following us. Thank you. Long thank life you. to MEM. Thank you very much for this very inspiring last panel uh, of today about sustainability in food, food transformation. Um, and I think it's legitimate as well, since uh, the young change makers are at the forefront of uh, the forum, of the seminar of this week here in uh, Lugano. So I would like to open up the floor to a last question uh, of the young change makers here in the audience, please. Hello, thanks for your comments and uh, for sharing with us this relevant subject. I would like to ask you, how could MEM region improve youth livelihoods and intercooperation along the region using a systemic approach improving the food systems? Who would like to answer this? Well, I just favor Pio because it's next to me. <laughs> yeah, but it uh, uh, then can be added. Uh, start with something that you have in common. Could be even a, a, a difficult element, water, for instance. How you wanna deal the, with the water related in, into food, like, and this, this brings you already to a lot of technical discussions. This is, by the way, the way I started my, my work in Syria and Israel was exactly with this topic in the 80s. You can start from there, why not? Yeah, I mean about you mean the problem with water scarcity. No, about what could be as a way to go. Just very uh, briefly. Well, to get this. currently I don't know, but I I just didn't go, get the question really clear. So I think I think that very quickly probably we, we want to say that um, because we mentioned the COVID-19 um, pandemic that um, in most cases crisis can be great opportunities and I think that when we have a problem and not just we share something positive in commons but also problems that we uh, experienced uh, solving those problems from different angles and promoting knowledge exchange can be a fantastic opportunity to make progress on fields that may have been touched upon the pandemic and so the pandemic may be an opportunity for the region as well. So maybe if you allow me, I just take it. The, for instance, you can work on the proximity of the systems, right? Not just rely on the system globally, because we are facing a time in which you have to consider region. So regionally, okay, the, you can Im start imagining producing, modifying, having bioviacity and, uh, and marketing systems that are much more localized, that are much more related to use of technology, digitalization, and so on, while reorganizing, re redefining your traditions, the famous renewed traditions that we've been talking about and what George is also indicating. This is something that you, it's, it would be a project, a unifying project that's very strong, how you you localize, but not in terms of national food security, but a regional way to tackle the food issue. This would be a, a very good project, which uh, actually, if you come up with this one, we, I would love to join you. <laughs> Wonderful. So I think we would leave it like, like this. And uh, it's great you know, to open up the floor to future projects. So we really hope that this idea, this is this new endeavor will um, happen in the future. So thank you again for this last panel um, and uh, have a lovely evening. So today's program will be concluded with some storytelling. Storytelling coming from the Piazza Grande in Locarno under the title of Conversation on Cinema Across Borders. We have pre-recorded this video that will be shown in a minute. 
and it has been pre-registered at the Locarno Film Festival some days ago. The dialogue will be uh, between the artistic director of the festival, Joanna Nazaro, and the young film director, Basil Randur from Jordan, who actually premiered his LA, the LA, the premier film that show on the Piazza Grande. Please, let's watch this video together. I think it is interesting that the creative talent in the MENA region, but not only, tried to create a set of auctionable answers and solutions from themselves without waiting for support from the outside and the great variety of possible ways of expressing uh, talent, articulating stories is quite extremely interesting because I have this uh, feeling that cinema and all the people that are working around cinema simply got fed up and tried to make their own thing. I would say the invisible quality of those people that this is so crucial because there is still this uh, stereotype of uh, that certain films need, need uh, to sound and look poor, whereas those films are extremely stylish. They have a lot of glam potential. The uh, political preconditions feels as if everybody's forced to address political issues in just one way. There are so many different ways to be political. And for me, for, for instance, beauty is one of the strongest ways of being political. And if I may, I mean, watching your films, your film yesterday on the piazza and listening to the silence from the audience part, I felt that was quite amazing. And when they, the film ended and they cheered, I think that cinema has a future because there are people that are literally fighting to tell their stories the way they want to tell them. And these people, they don't compromise on integrity, on vision, on style, and the diversity is so great, it gives me great hope. No, I think that's uh, that's you know sums it up. It also speaks to the uh, creative urge and itch to to create something, to put something out there. And like you said, beauty can be political in and of itself. Uh, so we can tell stories that are uh, that seem on the surface apolitical, but by just telling a human story, you are uh, um, you know if you're humanizing uh, uh, just everyday life and everyday people who in, in, in are generally, it's in, you know, if you look at the news and what's going on in the news and, and you only consume that, then it becomes just a headline or just a number or just a topic uh, and not an actual human story. So by simply making a story and by simply making a film, um, it is a political statement in and of itself. Uh, the creative urge has many facets in filmmaking and, and, and you know, so you can be hyper niche and, or you can be the person in front of the camera or, or uh, the actors, yeah. There is clearly a need to express and tell stories um, because you're getting, uh, within the past five years, six years, they've been, there's been some, some nice diversity in, in the Middle Eastern filmmaking. Uh, so you have some, you know, hyper art, art house films. You have some genre films coming out. You do have some political films coming out. You do have some human interest films coming out. And and this all comes, you know, from a very gut uh, need to share a story and to, and to tell a story and to create art. Um, and so uh, it's changing in in a positive way because it's it's grassroots change. Uh, and then there's also the collaboration with, um, you know, official entities like, uh, you know, co-productions co are, you know, much more receptive to these new filmmakers, to fresh voices, 
uh, first-time filmmakers, and uh, so this collaboration with Europe is is something that uh, that is strengthening, and I hope it continues to. Yeah, I think that's extremely interesting what you just said. But for me, the element, the key element here is grassroots. Um, if I might add a personal touch, um, the first time I went to Beirut, I witnessed the shooting of a video clip made a uh, video clip directed by Nadim Tabe and uh, I realized once more that the so-called Middle East does not exist if not in geographical terms because the idea that we have uh, and I say we because I mean I can not call myself out of the equation is a lazy one because we imagine other people always as slightly worse than ourselves. And the fact that we keep on telling all the same stories about how we represent them. So it's not a problem that you have. It's a problem that we, as global discourse, put on your shoulders. Because each time something bad happens, you have to explain that you are not like the bad guys. Each time something, uh, you have to explain that you respect women, but no one tells us you have to respect the women in, in Europe, in the workplace, you have to be less sexist and this and that. It's always other people that are to blame. All the different films that are coming from Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Qatar, Jordan, and uh, Iraq, and so on. I mean, they all tell specific, and each time we meet this film, we'll say, oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, because you were not paying attention. You were, or maybe you were not doing your work if you are supposed to work in culture. So, for instance, a film like uh, Dashra by Abd El Hamid Bouchnech, a horror film from Tunisia that addresses the superstitions that are still lingering in the region and does it so effectively that the film travels all over the world. I mean, just pay attention. Things are happening. So you can't blame other people for things not happening if you are not paying attention, because they do. So I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. And uh, for me, if I could express a wish, I would love to have uh, tons of films that would literally flood the market and you know, provoke a wonderful conversation that would last for years to come. Um, I think this goes to exactly what Giona was saying is, you know, generally uh, people are lazy and they like to give somebody a label. They like to put them in a certain pigeonhole. They, start, they like to um, easily just say this person is this because, you know, he's from there or from, he's from here or they, they're from this ethnicity or this religion. And uh, um, one way to fight uh, uh, this laziness is to actually just bring cinema to them and bring um, stories to them that are just everyday stories or they could be cultural stories. Um, and one way to uh, uh, bring that about is to create these co-productions because in co-productions there's always an incentive to bring these films to Europe and uh, have them consumed in Europe. Um, uh, but again, like we were saying, the, the burden shouldn't be on the filmmaker to want to, to need to um, change uh, European perspectives of the Middle East, for example, uh, but rather just to create stories. And the stories themselves will do that without that. Um, and um, collaborating with European co-producers who, who are just interested in good stories for the sake of good stories, uh, uh, you know, that's probably the best relationship. But as a byproduct, you, you are also um, addressing uh, uh, what was talked about is, is this need or uh, ease of labeling uh, the other wherever they're from um, and uh, uh, yeah stories stories do naturally you know build a normal empathy and an awareness that that you that a person is uh, 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 just slapping labels on on the other wherever they're from film I watched it the first time I found it so incredible incredibly crafted each time the setting changes something is happening if you pick this film apart in actually in structuralistic terms. In every frame, something is happening. 
If you don't want to pay attention, you're actually asked to do so because you can't simply look away. And uh, this is one of the films that you don't feel like you have to pick your phone to check the time or the mail. So, and it was so fine-tuned with every nuance. It was never black and white. It, so, I mean, I, I could go on rambling uh, incoherently away for hours about this film. But I just want to address the issue of co-production. Co-production is necessary not for the people in the region. It's necessary for us because we are living in our tiny headspace and we are always thinking that we know all the answers. And it's not true. We need other people to come and open our windows that we have been shutting down for ages. We need, I mean, it seems we can't do it alone, okay? I mean, we know, we think we know, we, are, we, we know all the answers, but we don't. We don't even know how to open our windows. So for me, when I hear co-production, I say, please come, help us do better films. It's not that we are coming with our money, please take our money so that we can feel good. I said, no, it's we need your help. Because otherwise we're stuck in our head. And this is, allow me to say so, I know it's a heavy word, but this is a colonial mindset that we need to help people. No, it's us that need help because we are stuck in this mindset. We cannot even begin to start thinking how to relate to other people because either we are bleeding heart liberals or rabid conservatives. You know, there's no middle way. It seems that the other does not exist beyond the polarizing categories by which we think of the world. So therefore, co-production are necessary, not for people like Bessel, but for people like us to let new energy flow in, in our rooms where the air is still and where the windows have been closed for too many, too much time. And we need other people's energy to keep going again. This for me is a change of paradigm that I literally dream of. So, and this is why I'm so grateful that Bassel accepted to be in the festival because we need storytellers like him. We need talented people like the actors that we saw on yesterday on screen. We need that freshness, that raw edge that brings uh, something new that keeps us on our toes and that makes us think where we are. Uh, it, it means the world to, to me and the team. I mean, we, we had the most magnificent uh, premiere experience yesterday, uh, you know, on the Europe's biggest screen with an amazing sound system and just an awesome audience. Uh, really, you know, the reactions were just getting, without looking at people, you just get a sense of their reactions and it, it felt like they were quite, it's an immersive experience uh, to begin with, so it, it felt like they were going with the film beat by beat and uh, just, I, I, I can't praise it enough, it's, uh, it's uh, really something else. In the, you know, playing the alleys, uh, which is the alleys of Jordan in the alleys of Locarno is, is <laughs> was amazing. So we started out doing research. I was doing research with a friend of mine, Mahmoud Abu Farha, who comes from the neighborhood we filmed in. And uh, in spending this time uh, doing research, we meet all of these characters on, along the road. And then you realize everybody has a story because whenever somebody passes, he'd pull me aside, do you like Basil? This person's story is this, 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 and that person's story is that, that, that. And then, you know, I was doing research, so I want to get to the truth. So I kept, you know, trying to push and him and, and others, and, you know, in, in search of truth. And I, I realized that, you know, it, the truth exists there, but it's also a lot of gossip and exaggeration, and, and it's just the way it is. So it was quite difficult to find the truth, but at the end of the day, I realized that the gossip and uh, these stories were the spirit of the place. That's how the place is. That's, you know, these... It's an intimate, claustrophobic place, and, and these stories are how it is there. And um, so I ended up not going for the truth, but going for the spirit of the place. And, and I, I hope I got it. You know, I, I felt like ultimately I mixed um, uh, the research with 
some of the you know dark humor pulpiness that I enjoy in cinema myself. So it, so it ended up being a blend of an attempt to represent uh, authentically as much as possible, but making it also uh, on some level maybe a piece of popular, an attempt to make a piece of popular cinema that could be consumed by uh, us, sorry, us first and then, uh, uh, and, then, uh, and then everyone else. I wish wholeheartedly for the future of Locarno to welcome more talented filmmakers like Basil Gandur and to welcome more exciting films like The Alice because it's this kind of talent, this kind of stories that make our festivals special because they are special. I'm so honored, thank you so much. With this last video that we've just seen from Locarno, we again have seen the central role of the arts, cinema and culture, not only for the region, but to unite around the whole world. So, thank you for this. We have arrived to the end, to the conclusion of this fourth edition of the Forum here in uh, Lugano. So I am pleased to hand over the concluding words to Professor Gilles Capel and the Rettore Boas Eres of the University of La Svizzera Italiana. Please. Thank you very much, Shokran Jezilan. Grazie mille, merci beaucoup. Uh, comme les années précédentes, ce forum a été un moment très riche et euh, très important. Et finalement, nous nous sommes adaptés à la situation sanitaire internationale. Vous savez, on dit parfois que le progrès technique n'est envisageable qu'à partir du moment où il y a eu un obstacle à surmonter. Nous avons essayé de surmonter l'obstacle du covid des restrictions de circulation et finalement adopter ce format en hybride qui s'est avéré particulièrement satisfaisant à la fois parce que le nombre restreint mais significatif des jeunes change makers invités a permis à une communauté de se former, euh, d'échanger avec beaucoup d'intensité, et puis aussi parce que euh, nous avons pu, à travers euh, les télétransmissions, contacter euh, des gens à travers le monde qui n'auraient certainement pu se déplacer. Donc je crois que c'est finalement, euh, nous avons fait d'un mal un bien, et euh, c'est tout à fait réjouissant, et bien sûr, Je voudrais, euh, d'un point de vue de responsable scientifique du colloque, remercier aussi de tout mon cœur les euh, équipes administratives et techniques euh, qui nous ont aidés au premier rang desquelles, et c'est elle qui a été la conceptrice de toute cette hybridation, hybridité, euh, la dottoresse Federica Fredani, que je vous demande d'applaudir. Merci, carissima Fede. Et euh, par ailleurs, euh, je trouve que la journée euh, de forum d'aujourd'hui a été particulièrement riche. D'une certaine manière, ce que nous entreprenons intellectuellement et culturellement sur plan universitaire a trouvé son écho dans euh, l'initiative euh, du... Euh, Euh, ministre des Affaires étrangères, je sais qu'on ne dit pas comme ça en Suisse, de la Fédération, Ignazio Cassis, euh, qui est venu inaugurer le forum avec euh, son euh, collègue euh, Omanet et euh, les débats qui s'en sont suivis avec euh, les jeunes gens et les jeunes filles ont été euh, particulièrement intéressants. L'échange avec euh, le prince Turki El Faisal, euh, euh, qui est peut-être l'une des mémoires vivantes de, euh, de la région, euh, patron des services secrets saoudiens avant le 11 septembre, euh, 
qui connaît à peu près tout et tout le monde, a été aussi, je crois, parfait, particulièrement fructueux. Et euh, Matteo Legrenzi ainsi que euh, les jeunes changers ont su tirer bien sûr le meilleur profit de cela. Et euh, pour le reste, aussi bien euh, le débat sur euh, les euh, enjeux religieux, les enjeux économiques, euh, l'alimentation, la, euh, euh, je crois, ont été vraiment parfaitement euh, to the point pour euh, réutiliser un peu d'anglais. Donc, euh, nous venons euh, aujourd'hui, à ce moment, à la phase conclusive. Je souhaite bien sûr que ce forum continue. Je crois qu'il gagne de plus en plus en visibilité, non seulement sur la scène helvétique, mais également sur la scène internationale. Les citations de celui-ci dans la presse italienne, notamment, mais aussi dans la presse française, se sont multipliées cette année, aussi à l'occasion, évidemment, de la chute de Kaboul et de l'anniversaire du 11 septembre, et je voudrais terminer par démentir une rumeur, euh, monsieur le recteur Magnifico, nous n'avons pas organisé la chute de Kaboul pour faire de la publicité au forum, c'est une fausse information, et je tenais à le dire euh, avant même de vous céder la parole et de vous remercier pour avoir investi les énergies considérables de l'Università della Svizzera Italiana, dans l'organisation, une fois de plus, de cette initiative qui euh, remet, d'une certaine manière, Gano au centre de ces processus d'échange, de médiation du Moyen-Orient, dans laquelle la Suisse euh, a une expertise ancienne et que, euh, grâce à votre initiative, euh, on voit aujourd'hui renouvelée. Merci encore beaucoup. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you very much. Shukran Jezidan Liljemia. Cher Gilles, merci d'avoir démenti cette rumeur avant même qu'elle parte. Euh, cela me rassure énormément. Euh, enfin. Les choses sont comme elles sont et euh, je crois que c'était tout à fait approprié que euh, la presse s'intéresse à avoir euh, ton opinion euh, sur euh, ce qui se passe en moment dans la région du monde. Euh, ceci pour rappeler euh, l'importance de la capacité d'analyse de certains universitaires dont tu es et euh, nous te savons gré pour toute l'énergie et l'intérêt que tu as porté à cette initiative que au fond, nous avons euh, bâti ensemble. On my side, for this conclusion, I, I, I would actually go back to the introductory words uh, I spoke this morning. In fact, I concluded by saying that what unites us is more important than what divides us, which is one of the mottos of the MEM Summer Summit. And it, it was interesting to see, uh, in many ways, how the various participants, who of course uh, have been invited by us, uh, actually share uh, this view from their different perspectives. Uh, I've also insisted on our methodology, which is actually to work together with the young change makers on uh, creating new narratives. And it has been said that words are important. Words are important. And of course, all of the people who have spoken at the forum have used words, have carefully chosen the words. And the fact that we're organizing uh, this MEM Summer Summit, of course, doesn't mean that as a diversity, as organizer, we support everything that has been said. Um, the point is precisely that this is part of a larger initiative, which we call the MEM Free Thinking Platform. So it is important that people speak their minds and we offer food for thought. And I don't think that anything that has been said today is the final word on anything. And sometimes it is indeed true that questions are more important than answers. But uh, 
I think also that some important things have been mentioned that are in phase with what we are organizing here, and, it's, and I would like to emphasize some of those. For instance, there was a panel, I mean, centered around the role of religion, and, and there there was a discussion about, well, the role of religion as a tool and, or as a field that is, has its own independence, autonomy with respect to the political field. This is, of course, something very important in the region, but of course also in Europe, where in some countries, I mean, these tensions are still, one can still feel these tensions. It has been said, well, for instance, in the, in the, in the panel on food transformations, well, the way these things are dealt with at the world level, and well, the panelists have told me that in a sense, one of the most important things that has cut off their discussion is that the methodology that is now used at the global level is something that is very similar to what we foster here with the MEM Summer Summit, namely to combine a top-down and a bottom-up approach, which is in a sense, a new way forward. So I'm quite sure that you who have followed the forum, who've had echoes of the seminar, will think that some of the things that have been said are of interest, and I really hope that you will be able to go back to the contents that have been discussed by going over the uh, recordings that are now available online. Please let me end by being somewhat more precise than Gilles Capel in thanking the many, many people who have contributed to making this uh, summit possible. Of course, I can't thank all of them uh, by name, but of course, to start with, I would like to thank the young change makers who have come here. In fact, when you share the same facilities for a week, and you have different opinions, you put yourself at risk. And it's by no means evident to accept an invitation like ours and to come here and to actually risk to be contaminated by different ideas, different experiences that might change your life in one way or the other. So thank you again for coming here. Thank you to all the young change makers who have um, followed us during the seminar in which you have not seen uh, today. I would like to thank the speakers of General Link for their participation, the seminar facilitators, um, the team of Bites of Transformation, in particular Ambassador Pio Van Oopst, the, uh, the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, their Swiss embassies who've contributed with the selection and who have participated in the seminar and with their expertise. I would like to thank uh, the Swiss public broadcasting uh, company in RSI in particular for their enthusiastic contribution and their technical competence, the interpreters, the photographers, various volunteers who have helped us uh, in many, many ways, the Locarno Film Festival who has partnered with us and of course, the services of the university um, who are uh, working during the summer to make this possible. And uh, really, I mean, this I mean, is something which doesn't go uh, without saying. And I would also uh, personally thank, well, our <coughs> host, in a sense, uh, our uh, uh, master of ceremony, Diana Segantini, who, uh, as you have witnessed, has, uh, well, knows many of the languages uh, that were useful here today, which means she is acquainted with the cultures and she brings a personal touch that uh, facilitates uh, all, of, all of the debates. And, of course, Federica Frediani, whom she uh, very rightfully uh, already has thanked, who's actually uh, the mastermind behind all of this, and without her uh, overall careful and competent uh, coordinator and organization, I mean, this would not have possible. Thank all of you for following us, and, well, hope to meet you again next year 
for a somewhat similar program in the same spirit, hoping that things will be better in 2022 than they were this year. Merci beaucoup, uh, grazie mille, shukran jazil and uh, yajamiya kullum. Very, very humbled and honored that I've been able to come back to this um, uh, summer summit uh, that is very important to my heart and to uh, all the territory here. So I'm very, very proud of um, having had such a wonderful, humbling experience especially with the change makers who could make it to uh, Lugano. But I would also like to thank the audience who's following us uh, today and has been following us also during the seminars uh, online. So thanks for all the technical facilities that have enabled us to bring it all together. And of course, I really hope, inshallah, that uh, we will meet next year all in person here in Lugano, as the Rettore has said this morning already, this human interaction, this direct dialogue is really enriching. So we hope for the future to get together, all of us. Shukran, grazie mille, arrivederci.